weird feedback mode. Entire screen. Okay. Right, and then now you got to go. Now Present to everyone. Then go with no. Now set your uh, present to everyone, and Good. and and then now you need to um, start your um, PowerPoint. Bring up a PowerPoint so you don't feed back into yourself. And then I'll go check it. Um, That's good. Okay, bring that up. Then we'll go. We'll bring this to the projectors. Wow, we are right on time. And then let me go make sure this actually transmitting. <laughs> I wanted to make that Oh, no, Thank you very much. Um, and I don't know if, if you wanted to just pull up the presentation, make sure it's all yes. good. Yes, yes, please yes. do. I'll be cool. back in two seconds. No problem. Thank you. So here is the presentation. So what's happening is this screen is being shared through a Google Hangout to your over here as well as to the word. Okay. okay, is there any reason I should care about no, that? No, you don't. Okay. okay. I'm going to give you a microphone. Good. Okay. One of these will be your when you when it is time for you to speak. A few seconds before that you can mm -hmm. and there is a clip here yep. that you put as close to your tire or something. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. And then you just exit this and you go. Okay. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is let me show you. I'll set up your presentation to bring us here. Please. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now I'm. <clears throat> Right now, I'm, yeah, it works. So you might want to turn it off. Right here is your presentation. The the one that says ICSSC twenty twenty seven. That's the one. Yeah. So you can click see. Actually, if you could open that quickly, just so I can sure. flip through it. Sure. So, right? Yeah. Yep. That's right. Okay. So when when it is time, we'll put it in the slideshow sure, mode. Sure. Let me let me just actually you probably should go full page now. We will, yeah. So we are just taking the keynote you know, his academy. Okay. Did you did you do that or did I do that? I don't know. We'll, okay, we're I'll, not sharing. Yeah, so I'll get out from here.
Oh, I wonder if we can actually, yeah. I wonder if that'll run. That Tim? That'll run. Sure. If it doesn't. Okay. So what we can do? This is the last thing. No, this is somewhere here. It's actually back up. Let's let's see what happens. You no. could run like uh, you have to open the hyperlink. I think. Yeah. Yep. Mm. And then say yes. Yeah. Excellent. Um, that my turn. Right? Yep. Sounds good. Is there supposed to be audio? Fast. Is there yeah. supposed to be audio no, on it? No. Oh good. Then no. it sounded great. <laughs> okay, so that'll actually happen. Great. Yes, I think so. Okay. Where did that did I close the hangout? I may have closed the hangout by mistake. I don't know. We'll see. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, uh, could we get back to my presentation? And I'm yeah, that's the next yeah. couple. Of, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Hey, um, Bill. Hey, you. Okay. No, we need to share the screen. No, no, no. I may have closed out right now. By mistake, right? Show, show the closed out the transmission. May have. I think it's. I think you did. I think I'm seeing it. I'm seeing this transmitted. I'm not huh. seeing it up there. You have to share the screen. Oh, oh I okay. see. Enable it. I'm going to move some slides around. Okay. Mm -hmm. There we go. I'm still seeing the slides change on, yeah. on air. Oh, okay. So that's how go, that's going out to YouTube. That's good. That's good. I haven't started recording it though. That's okay. No problem. Sorry, this will just take me a minute. That's okay. Uh, take okay. your time. So no pressure. No. <laughs> so here. I should also wait a minute. I changed the batteries. We have some spares there. Thank you. <clears throat> you empty the batteries. Um, this yeah. and all that. The what? The DVD? Yeah, yeah. I have the DVD from yesterday, and I got two new ones. As soon as I go back over to the <coughs> shop, I'll give it to Adam to put on your web and my web and uh, our server. Oh, wow, this is big, but it's so. Are you going to set up your machine? Yes, so, yeah, we'll unlock it. We'll set it up over there, and I can run it on your presentation and put it on the monitors. Yes, and I have the remote right here ready to go. I'm going to, I'm just going to say one, two, three, and show. Yeah, <clears throat> I, this was made for a different audience. Yeah, no worries. So I, uh, I get it. Oh, this is it. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, the batteries might be low. Yeah. No, there you go. Yeah. Go ahead. It was my mistake. You are not mistakes, only challenges. <laughs> Thank you. 
There. Okay. I am now happy. Good. Thank you very much. So now. Okay, that's what we should be doing. Good. Hey, you go can, back to your. Can you go to the phone that it is streaming? Yep. Thank you. I should see four of those now. <clears throat> oh, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, we need to get it out of that. And how do you get it? Well, on a on a Mac, go under settings. So, so you have to lose that for a second. And up to view. Click view, and it should be normal. Uh, normal should be normal. We are in normal. Go ahead and hit F five. Yes. No, we do, do not want notes page. Duplicate page. Where do you see? Okay, hold on. Let me get in for a second. Duplicate. What? We are on blue. Yeah. Okay, so I don't have to stand. Here. No, no. You can. Yeah, this is a slight change. And that's great. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. We're good? We're live? Okay. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming. Um, it's early, I know, but we have a lot to go through, and I'm going to be very quick with my introduction, and then uh, Michelle will introduce Dr. Rosler, who is our keynote speaker today. Um, just a quick, I jotted down some of the numbers for you guys to see how the workshop is growing. I don't have uh, very early year numbers, but I do have some numbers for last four or five years. And um, because early four, early one or two years, nobody knew where it is going to go. <laughs> so we didn't keep any numbers. So, um, uh, but before I get to those quick logistics for anybody who is new here, um, I mean, who didn't come here yesterday, uh, the workshop is open to everybody. Um, we do not care with, I mean, we do want actually students to come in. We don't want just the practitioners and those who are wanting to get into the profession, we do want them to come in. And uh, it doesn't matter what nationality they are from. Uh, it just, uh, there is a request that any foreign national or even US citizens with foreign organizations should register with the registration desk. And that's about it. Uh, the, uh, there is a shuttle provided from Homewood Suites to here at 7.30 a.m. and it goes back and forth. It's very uh, short distance. There is a shuttle provided from here to Homewood at the end of the workshop and on Wednesday dinner. Uh, there is parking reserved for attendees only. Um, the restrooms are across the lobby. Please do not exit from that back door there. That goes into some sort of reserved area. So please don't go through that. Just use this front door that you see here right next to the clock. Um, any questions, feel free to come and ask me or the front desk. Thank you very much. Um, let's get to, I'm going to start with thanking the sponsors because without them, we just couldn't give you all kind of uh, support, the food and the dinner, um, all sorts of 
uh, things that we have purchased, they are only possible because of the sponsors. Most uh, and also obviously thanks to all of you uh, for coming here and presenting. And there is a larger community which is um, actually right now they might be listening on the YouTube live stream. Yesterday there were about 22 present. Um, uh, at one time there were 22 people who were listening into it. Today there might be more. This is the history of the workshop that I could get, cobble together. Over it started in 2007. Uh, you can see number of talks have increased a lot. Um, we they jumped up a lot when CFS Community Day was added, clearly around uh, 2015, and uh, that 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 shows you uh, also a clear jump into the user community that we access. We are not advertising this workshop anywhere. It's just word of mouth and people in the spacecraft community, flight software community, those who know, they, they come here. The presentations are not weighted like IEEE conferences or anything. These are just simple, um, but very important ones. And you get to meet a lot of people here. Uh, our sponsors are, number of our sponsors is increasing. And I can see that the people, number of people attending in person is clearly increasing every year. So thank you very much. Um, how do we manage this? Uh, we, we have a lot of administrative support that we take from the hosting organization. Uh, Rhonda and Terry, the ones you saw outside, uh, there is a lot of support from the AV folks and, and also from accounting. A uh, lot of volunteers make this happen. They, we, we meet almost like bi-weekly for five months. Um, and then from call of presentation to the last day. And then we also meet uh, once a month uh, throughout the year. Anybody among you is welcome to join, especially those who want to host the workshop in upcoming years, anybody from those organizations, they're welcome to join this. Uh, any, <clears throat> we do have a constant contact and I request you guys to put that under, you know, make sure it is not uh, filtered out by your spam filters. And uh, we are now using the Gmail to contact you. Uh, that and constant contact, those are the two main ways we contact you. We take uh, just about $2,500 from the sponsors and um, our expenses are the ones that we have listed. Accounting is kept by GHU APL. Uh, in future, any questions you have, please send those to the that email or just even space FSW email and we'll be good to, uh, we'll take, in, take those into account. Uh, if you would like to volunteer, or if you think that number of days should be increased or whatever your suggestions are, feel free to send those. That's, <clears throat> that's it for me, from me. I'm going to hand over to Michelle. We are running a little bit behind, but I think that's okay. Thank you. I need to take a quick second. Oh, okay. So I'll just say that. So I'm going to stand next to you. Yes. Um, so I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker. Um, Dr. Gordon Ressler is a retired Navy captain, and he has a bachelor's in physics from the Naval Academy. And then he went to MIT to I'm trying to figure out. Oh, you can speak into this. Sorry. That's what I was trying to speak into. Okay. <laughs> Um, and then he got his PhD at MIT in physics. Um, I'm going to just share snippets of his career with you, and you can really see the, his research passions as I share these with you. So in 2002, he was a program originated the spacecraft for universal modification of orbits, called Friend and Robotics, enabling near-term uh, demonstration called Friend. Um, after being a DARPA program manager, he worked as a physicist in the Ocean Sciences Division at SAIC, where he proposed and managed a research program for a revolutionary wave-aware control system for small manned and unmanned boats. Um, in 2009, he was the Director of Energy Informatics at USC, 
where he started new programs in the application of computer science to energy systems. In 2012, he was the senior project engineer at the Australian Centre for Space Engineering Research um, at the University of South Wales, defining a program for a spacecraft to monitor Australia's natural resources. So you could see that his love of the ocean has been a huge impact in where he's been. Um, now he, in 2014, he returned to DARPA in the Tactical Technology Office, and he is the program manager for the robotic servicing of geosynchronous <laughs> satellites. Um, so I'm really ecstatic to introduce him, and he will talk about the RSGS program today. Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. I can't tell from here. Um, oops, let's put this in the, the project mode here. Okay. I see this goes into this mode. Okay. But it's not in, okay. it's not doing that on the YouTube. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. That's wanna, okay. What do you want to do? Do you want to go to a different mode? That's what I'm trying to figure out. This is fine. Can everyone see that? Yeah. All right. Let's just uh, go, go through this. this. this okay. Um, so as, as Michelle said, I'm at DARPA and I am the program manager for a program called Robotic servicing of geosynchronous satellites. But what I, what I really want to do today is to get you to think more generally about robotic operations in Earth uh, and where it leads and, and what it means for the future of space operations. Give me one second. Okay. Um, I've been there for, for uh, the, the slides that we're using today, I presented recently at International Communications Satellite Conference in Trieste, lovely city if you haven't been there, um, talking to the people basically who design the payloads that go on the, the commercial communication satellites where your direct TV and, and your, your serious radio and that sort of thing come from. Um, and I'll explain why DARPA, a, a defense organization, is involved with the commercial business. Uh, hopefully that'll become clear. But what uh, oh, and I should, I should give you a disclaimer at the beginning. I know very, very little about flight software. Uh, I consider myself the cheerleader for this program as much as anything. Um, if, you know, if I, if I show them they're violating Newton's laws or some other physics-y like thing, they listen to me, but otherwise they, I try to leave them alone. How are we doing? Are we okay on this now? Um, so with that as a background, this, this is what we're trying to do. Um, there is nowhere on earth where we spend a billion dollars on a system and then never inspect it and never maintain it and never upgrade it. I mean, that's crazy, right? But that's what we do in space. So the idea of this program is let's, let's do those things for those billion dollar assets that are out there. The commercial ones are a mere $300 million or so. The, the million, mil, military ones can actually be over a billion dollars each. So let's be able to inspect them. Let's be able to repair them. Let's be able to upgrade them. Um, we are, we, our commercial partner, which we have, and I'll explain that, what that means in a little bit, uh, is even adding a refueling capability to our robotic servicing satellite to be able to increase the life of a satellite that's still working fine. It's just running out of gas. Uh, we'll be able to repair a couple of easy things like solar panels that are stuck. Um, we have cameras on the end of our robotic arms, so we'll be able to get within inches of mechanisms that have failed or something that we don't understand on the outside of a satellite. And we'll even be able to attach things. Um, now today, none of those satellites that are up there have USB ports on them, sadly. Uh, so when we attach something, it will have to have its own power and its own communication system. But there are still numerous advantages to attaching things today to the outsides of our spacecraft. There, there's new opportunities for businesses, uh, new opportunities for science. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna enable all those kind of things. Uh, what, what is DARPA, DARPA's role in this? Well it's, well, it's what it always is. We overcome the technical barriers. Um, we, in this case, are doing something that goes beyond 
a demo. Often what DARPA will do is we'll do something and demonstrate a technology to a certain level, and then we'll say, let's say to the military, do you want this or don't you? Um, an example of that was the stealth program in the 19, late 1970s and early 1980s. DARPA built a, a technology demonstrator for stealth that was called Have Blue. If you looked at it, you'd think it was an F-117, but it's really 80% scale. Uh, and then the, the, you know, the military took that over and invested in the actual production line. This program's a little bit different. Our satellite is gonna last between eight and 15 years. It's gonna have enough propellant on it to do dozens of service missions because we wanna change the way space is done. And we didn't think that a single demonstration would do that. As a matter of fact, we have some objective evidence that says it won't do that. So as, you, as many of you know, the, the, the design community for satellites is very conservative. So we thought that by staying on orbit for several years and doing dozens of missions, that, that the design community would start saying, oh, okay, this actually works. It's safe, it's reliable, uh, it's useful. So how can we design our satellites to take more advantage of it? Um, and that's what I mean by develop years of operational experience and data and sustain the capability. Um, we also want the entire world to understand what we're doing and what, what the possibilities of this technology are. So we'll be reporting our position to the Space Data Association. Um, we'll be sending down real-time video. I'm hoping to have the Discovery Channel work on this someday. Um, so that's, that's really what my program is all about. But I'm gonna try to be more general and talk about you know, what, what should we, how should our imaginations work with this? Um, so we are going to geosynchronous orbit and people in the scientific community don't think much about this orbit, but um, you know, they asked Willie Sutton, the bank robber, why did he rob banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is. Well, geo is where the money is folks. Um, so here's a table of the revenues. In other words, the value of the bits that went up to geo and back by year. Uh, you know, last year it was $127 billion. Now compare that to the budget of any organization you want to think about. NASA, $19 billion. Certainly DARPA, $3 billion, right? That's a lot of money. Um, and the reason is because of that persistence, right? So so here's your direct TV antenna on your house, and it doesn't have to steer, right? That has economic value. That has enormous economic value. Uh, so there's over 300 commercial satellites in this orbit. And, and so now I get to explaining why DARPA chose to partner with industry to do this, because there's uh, 50 or 60 government satellites in this orbit, but over 300, so we said, well, if this satellite that we're spending a lot of money on to build can service those commercial satellites as well as the, the government ones, we'll get more opportunities to get data. We'll see it operate five times as often as if it was only servicing the government one. Um, so we entered into this partnership with industry in order to do this. Uh, so, and by the way, if the government needs to use it, we can write them a check. So the idea, the, the kind of program idea is to get national security value from the satellite. I mean, that is the D in DARPA's defense, right? But by providing this thing and making it self-sustaining because it'll make money for, for the owner by servicing these 300 commercial satellites, we'll get the data. We'll understand how it works. We'll get the lessons learned, what it can do, what its limitations are, and that sort of thing. It'll be available. Uh, so it's kind of a win-win, both for the government and for industry. Um, great. Um, so this year, the news from GEO wasn't all that good. <laughs> These are four news articles on, on failures. Um, so you saw the 300 birds or so up there. What that means, given their lifetime, is that every year, oh dear, did I do that? Well, uh, so, so every year we send 15 or 20 satellites out there. When I say we, it's mostly industry. The government sends one or two. Industry sends you know, somewhere between 15 and 20. Um, and then 15 or 20 are thrown away because they've run out of propellant or something's broken. These are broken ones. Most of these were quite old, uh, 14 years old, 19 years old, 20 years old, 18 years old. 
they're, those are well beyond except that 14 year old guy. Uh, well, well beyond their design lives, which is typically 14 to 15 years. Nevertheless, um, it would be nice to be able to do something about this, to be able to go up and look at it and say, what went wrong? You know, a, a large cloud of debris came from this satellite and then they lost contact. Um, it's interesting that there's a company, Excel Analytics, that's actually making money by just imaging satellites. They're, they, you know, the, the operators buy these images, the government buy these, buys these images, uh, and they happen to be looking at this thing when there was a big puff and then the satellite went offline. Um, so these, we would like to try to deal with these mysteries. We'd like to, to get uh, a little bit more information and, and, and maybe do something about them in the future. So these, this, these are our notions. Uh, today, you know, first of all, whatever you're going to send up has to fit inside a fairing, one fairing, right? Um, the, the sort of poster child for, for this is the James Webb Space Telescope, which is really folded up, um, has 126 deployment mechanisms or something like that. Um, so that's a, that's a tough constraint. I mean, that's been very difficult, very challenging for the engineers in order to get all those deployments right and that sort of thing. Also, there's, as I've been harping on, there's, there's really nothing you can do about failures out there today. And you, you can't upgrade your style. You can upgrade your software, yes, okay. But if you want to put on a new antenna, uh, an, add a new processor, a new sensor, or something like that. That is, that is not something that we can do today, and we want to change those things. So we want to enable uh, on-orbit upgrades, on-orbit servicing, and, and even in the longer term, on-orbit assembly. I will tell you that my spacecraft does not have in its requirement set any assembly beyond attaching modules to operating spacecraft, but if you, if you look at the robotic arms, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, you'll, you'll see, you can imagine that they have the capability to assemble things. Um, that didn't work? It always, it always works, right? Garbage in, garbage out, I guess. I don't have it memorized, so I'm, I'm kind of at a loss here. You don't know what the Sorry. next slide is. Can you get me back in? It said hi, and then it just killed me. I recognize that. <laughs> there it is. My wife actually works for Microsoft. She has a, she has a really okay. interesting job. Makes a lot more money than I do, that's for sure. Once you go Mac, you never go back. Yeah, that's awesome. We want to extend. That's adequate, but not optimum. So, um, when I was, uh, I'll, I'll add lib here for a little bit. Um, when I was hearing this program, and, and as, as Michelle mentioned in my, my biography, I started the work at DARPA on unprepared spacecraft back 15 years ago. And then I came back to DARPA in 2014. Um, and, and, and the director of DARPA understood why I wanted to do servicing. She says, I get that. I understand the capabilities you're bringing. Uh, and I understand that the revenues will help to make it sustainable, that this commercial company will be able to do that. And she said, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in more than servicing, that I'm interested in transformation. I want to see everything change. I want to see modular satellites. I want to see huge things being built in geo and that sort of thing. And so we kind of have these two goals. We want to establish this persistent servicing capability, but we want, we want, we want the design community to look at this and say, okay, how, how can we take advantage of that's, that's the transformation that I'm talking about. How can we take advantage of highly dexterous uh, robotic capabilities in space? Uh, we're DARPA, we have to have a graph. Um, this graph was prepared by Dr. Brooks Sullivan uh, of Sullivan Analytical Technical Services. I think that's what he calls himself. Um, he works with me, he's, he's my CTO as I say. 
uh, and he thought about these, these um, different things that robotics sh should be able to do in terms of two uh, uh, figures of merit. One of them is value, which may not simply be monetary value, it may, may be something else, but, but some kind of value, and um, the, how complex is it? So, so you, can, you can see that these are highly qualitative. Nevertheless, one of the easiest things to do is just to go inspect the spacecraft. Now, the closer you get to it, the more challenging that becomes from a safety point of view. But, but the, there, there is a certain value associated with inspection. As a matter of fact, um, there are companies working on satellites, and, and the Air Force has a couple up there now, uh, that their only job is to do inspection of objects in geo. Uh, the Air Force's ones are called GSAP, which is a long acronym, but it's geosynchronous imaging. Um, there are commercial companies that are, that are looking to do this as well, just inspection. Um, uh, a little bit, uh, you know, at the other end of the scale on, on very hard and technical complexities to go inside a spacecraft and pull a box out and put another one in. I mean, that's, that's very, very difficult. We do not propose to do that. Um, assembly, it, it's interesting. Um, so repair. Studies have shown that some of the stuck solar panels and stuck antennas that happen at the beginning of life when, when you're first deploying an antenna. And that happens about once every two years to a geospacecraft, as it turns out. Studies have shown that sometimes it takes less than a pound of force in order to fix those. Just there's nothing there to apply that force today, right? Um, sorry? Yeah. They try. I mean, they, they do all this stuff. Jiggle, spin, what, uh, thermal baking, you know, all, all these kind of things. Sometimes it works. Um, uh, more, more difficult uh, rip repair jobs would, would have to do with, um, you know, actually, actually moving things around like a, 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 a harness tangled something or, or uh, some, some MLI came loose, you know, to stick it down. So, so there's a spectrum of what's, um, what's, what's involved in repairing a satellite that's already on orbit. And, and why do I say that assembly is actually somewhat less technically complex qualitatively because you have design control over both sides of the interface. You got to choose what the things were to, get, to go together, whereas in the repair case, you don't have that option. You have to deal with what you find when you get up there. So it does add a little bit of complexity. Um, today, replenishment is fairly technically complex because they're not designed to be replenished. So here are the steps in refueling a legacy spacecraft today. Peel an insulation back, cut a lock wire, take off what's called a B-nut, put on a safety valve in case you can't get the original valve shut, open the original valve, transfer the propellant, shut the valve, shut the safety valve, and replace the insulation, okay? So that's kind of a pain. On the other hand, the value is cosmic. It's a very valuable thing to do. If we start designing future spacecraft, um, so future is sort of in blue here, we start designing them with quick disconnects, the difficult becomes easy. It's a one-step process, right? Just put the probe and transfer propellant and you're done. NASA Goddard has already designed that quick disconnect. It's triple sealed. Uh, one of the nice things about it is it's got a label on it. So you're not, you know you're not gonna put the oxidizer in the fuel tank or vice versa. The ones today don't have labels because um, they're done on the ground. What do you need a label for, right? Who's, who's going to go and look at it once it's on orbit? Um, but we're going we're to be doing that. We're actually going to be doing this, this refueling. Relocation is sort of the first cousin of refueling. So instead of putting propellant into a spacecraft, we can dock with it and push it to a new orbit. The first uh, program that, that I started at DARPA back in 2002 was called SUMO. Uh, spacecraft for the universal modification of orbits. In other words, it was a space tug. And I did not choose the acronym because my last name is pronounced Ressler. That is a fallacy. That did not happen. Um, but it's, it, it is a high value activity and it's a lot easier than refueling. So my guess is that once we get up there, some operations are gonna be done with refueling and some are gonna be done with relocation. The highest value though, I'll tell you, is if you send up, let's say a commercial satellite $300 million plus the launch cost, plus the insurance, and a solar panel doesn't come out. 
well, God knows a billion dollar military satellite, the, the, the value of that operation is, is amazing. And, and the insurance companies are interested, right? Matter of fact, someday these spacecraft are going to be like the insurance adjuster. The, the insurance company will not pay you for damage to your car until they come look at it, right? So today, insurance companies pay uh, for, for anomalies on orbit without getting a chance to look at them and see what's going on. So these are the, this is the opportunity space that, that we're working in. Uh, this is a pretty good image of the satellite that uh, we are building today, RSGS. Um, we're, we're putting this dexterous capability up there, as I said, for two different reasons. One of them is to provide that resilience, those services to today's spacecraft, but also to motivate the design community um, to, to change the way they do things. Um, Public-private partnership, I, I, I hope I've explained the reason that we decided to partner with industry on this is that there's many more opportunities with commercial satellites for servicing than there are just government ones. Uh, the <laughs> revenues that they get from doing those servicing will sustain the capability. It does save the taxpayer money, indeed. Um, and our partner is SSL in Palo Alto, California, uh, the world's leading supplier of geospacecraft. Um, so this is their bus. This is their 1300 bus, and this is the government developed robotics payload on the end of it, um, in not quite its current form, but pretty close. Um, these two arm, the only, um, let's see, the, un, an unrealistic thing is that these arms are shown without the insulation on top of them. You, you can see the details of the joints in these pictures, but these would actually be covered by insulation. Thermal control of things in space is pretty interesting. Um, so that's my program. And uh, these are the things we, we propose to do. Um, the inspection that I mentioned, pushing on solar rays and that sort of thing. Here's the space tug mission. And finally, installing things just mechanically, because again, no USB port, just mechanical installation on operating spacecraft, both commercial and military. And our partner, SSL, is adding a refueling capability to complement these, this, these missions. Um, so once again, uh, things continue to go wrong, despite the investments we make in reliability and mission assurance and that sort of thing. Here's an, a military and a commercial example. Uh, in the case of the first advanced EHF satellite, it experienced a propulsion anomaly on the way to GEO. Uh, they were able to use their attitude control propellant in order to get it the rest of the way up, but of course that kind of limits your life because you've got all this primary propellant that you can't use and, and not enough ACS for its full lifetime. Um, so maybe someday that could benefit from a space tug to come along and, and bring it back to the, synchro the, uh, the stationary slot in the air uh, as its propellant uh, is exhausted. And then here's a commercial satellite, New Dawn, that had a, an antenna deployment anomaly. So the antennas, the reflectors are folded up here on the side of the satellite, and one of them didn't unfold properly. Um, continues to happen. So um, we've been working on this for a long time. And of course, all my pictures are hardware, software. Sorry, guys. I, you know, I don't have any software pictures, except, well, here's a rack, right? We've got a rack. Um, and we will talk a little bit about what it is that we're expecting out of our software and, and, and why. Um, th there's a lot more than a traditional, uh, let's say, a scientific mission or something like that. And I'll, and I'll explain why in a bit. Um, we started asking the question in the laboratory, is it possible for uh, a spacecraft to detect another spacecraft, range it, find its pose, come in and dock with it, all without commanding from the ground. Uh, there, there have been other missions that have, that have done, uh, you know, autonomous rendezvous and that sort of thing, but we wanted to go all the way into a docked condition with the robotic arm. So that program, that SUMO program, was a laboratory-only program. By the way, all of the robotics work that's being done here is being done at the, the Naval Research Lab uh, down in DC. Um, they're not the manufacturers of all the hardware, that they're subcontractors that are doing that stuff, but they are the integrators, they're, they're the, the brain trust, and certainly all the software is being done there. So we, we, in, in the laboratory at, at NRL, there is a facility 
And let me see. You said 50 minutes. Yes, okay. Um, where two spacecraft can be simulated to move with respect to each other, uh, all, all 12 degrees of freedom that are involved in that. Um, and, and we could test it with, with realistic flight, flight like software, flight like sensors, realistic orbit dynamics. And so we showed in 2005 that we could start at, say, 15 meters away and drive into zero, find the docking point that, that a human had selected and go in and dock with it, all with no operator input. And the way I knew that was all the controllers, when, when, the, when the demonstration started, they, they stood up and they walked away from their, their monitors and they just stood up and looked. That's how I knew it was autonomous. Um, uh, we do, however, we do intend to uh, enable teleoperation of the robotics as well. And that, that, that is a workstation that that can be done from. Um, so, automation versus teleoperation. When two spacecraft are in very close proximity and you're dealing with the time delays of going to geo, right? So the speed of light time delay is only about a quarter of a second. But when you add in network delays and compression and, and encryption and that sort of thing, the time delays can run up to several seconds. So in this dynamic situation, it's not safe to try to teleoperate that, that operation where one spacecraft reaches out to grab another. So that part of our robotic operation is automated. And I will, I will show you the stack of software that we use to do that in a little while. But once we've done that, and we, 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 there, there's this wide variety of things that we, we might want to do. Anomaly correction, like pushing on a solar panel is one of them. It's very difficult to automate that because you don't know a priori what the configuration is, and therefore what your your uh, uh, machine vision should be looking for. So, in once we have docked, once we have reached out, grabbed that customer satellite, and then rigidized the arm by setting the brakes on all of the joints, now we have a static situation instead of a dynamic situation. So now teleoperation; those time delays become annoying, but they're not unsafe. So that's the difference. We automate the dynamic operation and we teleoperate just, just for timeliness, you know, efficiency. We, we teleoperate some of the other operations. Um, so, so we have done, you know, there's a lot of hardware e stuff that's gone on. Um, but the software has been in development to do this since 2002. We keep, we keep improving and adding to it and that sort of thing. Um, We've developed a lot of tools to go on the end of the arms to give us a, a lot of variety. This little upside down Mickey Mouse looking thing at the bottom is a tool changer. So you can take one tool off of the robotic arm and put another one on. That gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, we've tested these arms for all the things you want to test them for in space. Um, launch environment, vibration testing, EMI, thermal vacuum. Um, and then we've done some integrated tests. So here's an engineering development arm with a simulated satellite deck with a bunch of tools on it. Here are actual qualified flight controllers using NRL's uh, Neptune <clears throat> flight control system in order to control this as though it were in flight. So that's going on very well. Okay, here's the one slide you'll care about. <laughs> um, I, I, I've mentioned that, that we, we want to do an automated docking for safety. So we've implemented in this stack of software what I call robot reflexes. We want the arm to reach out and find, find the point that it's going to dock with. So that's where we have in the upper right hand corner feature track, right? And different, different features have to have custom algorithms to identify them. So a circle, which May, may be the representation of a bolt hole. Some, some satellites are actually bolted onto their launch vehicles. Or a, a Marmon ring, which is a large aluminum uh, ring that, that uh, is duplicated spacecraft and booster, and then they're strapped together. Um, or something that someone's actually put up there intentionally. So we want to be able to recognize those with the feature tracking. We want Real-time pose and range determination as we move in. We're using LIDAR. Uh, we, we try to do this with, with stereo video and structured light. And the problem with that is sunlight. It goofs it all up. LIDAR 
is, is much more robust to, to some angle and that sort of thing. <clears throat> but we also, these reflexes are an automated response to something going wrong. Specifically, motion of that client satellite that wasn't anticipated. Right? We can tolerate a certain amount of motion, but if it exceeds that, and we didn't plan on it, we want that arm to come back, just like you're touching a hot stove. We want that to come back without the operator having to think about it, and we want it to come back on a path that is guaranteed free of collision. So we have an obstacle avoidance. Uh, I mean, that, that, that operates going in, but it also operates coming out. So we have an automated abort feature built in. We, and then our, our, so our, our FDIR, fault, fault detection and response, includes, but is not limited to, looking for unanticipated motions of the client. Um, so you know, you're familiar with the servo control, I'm, I'm sure, of you know, any, any sort of thing. And it's no different for robotics, except there are seven joints, so, so you have to figure out how to move the joints to get where you want to go. Um, but we also want the touch to be soft. We don't want to bump into our client because we will send it in a place where we didn't want it to go or will create damage. So there's, um, some of you may be familiar with the notion of compliance control, where there's a force torque sensor on the end of the arm and that feeds back into compliance control and allows the touch to actually be soft. Um, that, that's extremely important for, for safety. <clears throat> okay. I was actually, during, during some of the sumo demonstrations, they actually let me go down and move the model of the client satellite and watch the arm pull back all by itself. That, that's, that's very reassuring when you do that. Um, so the, the, the bus, the satellite bus, is being provided by our commercial partner. Oh, and, and by the way, I've, I've only shown the robotic arm control system. I haven't shown the entirety of, of the robotic payload software stack, unfortunately. <coughs> Actually, that's kind of ITAR, so, so that's not here. But this is, this is pretty straightforward. But that payload has to talk to the bus. And the bus is going to be responsible for the usual you know, navigational kind of stuff, and including RPO, um, the uh, RPO... Uh, function of the satellite is being done by Draper Labs, many of you may be familiar with. Um, so we have to figure out how these two things talk to each other and, and who's responsible for what. And when you, when you look at the, uh, the lists of things that we want to respond to, this, this is still an ongoing kind of, kind of design thing. Um, we will not approach our client within some distance, some number of kilometers yet to be determined until we have coordinated communications between the two operation centers. Uh, we, when we get very close, we want them to passivate their attitude control system. We do not want it maintaining active attitude control while we attempt to grab it. That's a, that's a recipe for things falling off spacecraft. Um, so, so there is a, 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 an amount of, of coordination that's required in the operations phase. And like most spacecraft, design programs we're, we're dealing with operations last <laughs> i hate that but that, that's just kind of what you have to do in terms of, of budget and efficiency and that sort of thing uh, but we'll get there so this was a 2010 demonstration i wish i had the video but it's hard to pass these things back and forth at the naval research lab of an automated repair let me take you through it up here at the top you can see a Marmon ring. This is, this is a mock-up of a, of a spacecraft. This ring would have held the satellite on the booster until it reached a certain stage in, in the launch, and then it's released. And on the side of the mock-up spacecraft, we have a solar panel, and it is simulated to be stuck. It is Velcro, actually. And this demonstration was to drive a tool in between the satellite bus and the solar panel to apply that pound or two of force to actually, uh, uh, you know, it's a simulated anomaly repair situation. Um, now, I told you before that what we wanted to do before we do anything like this is, is to dock. 
We want to we want to take the dynamics out of the situation. We want to go from a from a, a dynamic to a static situation. This particular demonstration was not done that way. This was done as a free floating dynamic repair. So the position is being maintained by LiDAR sensors on the simulated robot servicer over here. And we have, we're using the second arm as, a, as an off angle viewer to make sure that things are going well. Um, this could be necessary sometime if, for example, the, the thing that needed to be repaired was so far away from the, from the, mount, the, the, uh, the marmon ring or whatever the booster attached feature was that we, couldn't, we just couldn't reach it. So you might have to do it dynamically. Not the preferred option, but this demonstration uh, showed that that is at least feasible in some cases. So if this were a video, you would see, oh, oh we, have a, we have another sensor here. It's a little laser. You kind of see a red line right there. That was looking for this gap because the line turns black in the gap, and that's what the, that's what the target of the tool was going there. So if this were a video, you would have seen that solar panel pop out when the force was applied. Um, so a very comprehensive and convincing demonstration that these repair things are pretty feasible. Um, I said we wanted to attach things to satellites. So the Air Force is interested in attaching, let's say, cameras so they can look around their satellites. Uh, NOAA is interested in, in sending up some, some meteorological sensors this way. Uh, there are entrepreneurs that are thinking about sending up sensors for agricultural purposes to go to GEO. GEO is a great place because you're always staring at the same thing. And if you can do this, you can now think of sending up payloads that didn't have to be integrated with the bus. So much less expensive and faster to integrate as long as you can get them there and as long as you can prove compatibility with the host spacecraft. So EMI and center of gravity offset and all that sort of thing have to be worked out. The question is, how do you get them there? How do you get these payloads to GEO if um, they don't have a bus? Well, one way to do it is to share some room on a satellite that's going to GEO anyway. So you've probably heard of hosted payloads. Uh, this happens to be a hosted payload that is detachable. So, so there is a set of springs, basically, this lower uh, object, gray object. There's a set of springs that remains on a commercial communication satellite. Um, they have extra room and they have extra mass because they, they had satellite designs that used old style batteries, but when they converted to lith ion batteries, they got some, some benefit out of that. So they're trying to sell that benefit in hosted payloads and including this concept, this DARPA concept, which is going to fly, I think in January or February on a commercial satellite uh, called PODS, Payload Orbital Delivery System, but, but it's, it's mounted in the battery bay of, of a commercial satellite and then these springs actually eject it out into space. Um, it could be just a, you know, a free-flying satellite with some communications or whatever, or it could be something that's intended to be installed on another satellite. So in this case here, you can see a little ball and spring sticking down, ball and stick on a spring, sticking down from the bottom of the strong back. And that's a special feature that we have a tool on the robotic servicer to capture. And we can take this and transport it anywhere around the geo arc we want to go and either unpack it, take things off of it, or install it whole as is. And there would, there'd have to be some sort of a, a tool to, to uh, place it on its new host spacecraft. We have already done two such tools. One of them is kind of like a vice grip, and the other is actually a hot glue sort of thing. Um, so we add together this ability to do installation and replenishment with a delivery capability. Now we're talking actual on-orbit logistics, FedEx plus the cable guy, right? Um, so, we, and there's, and pods is certainly not the only way of getting things to geo. We have the ESPA rings. You could, you could have a dedicated payload that was full of things that you wanted to, to uh, you know, install around the geo belt. And then RSGS can come and capture the payloads, however they come up, transport them, unpack them, and install them on today's satellite. So I may not have emphasized enough the fact that our objective here is to service today's satellites, those that have been in no way prepared to be serviced. 
and 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 and, and usually the first question I get from an uh, an educated audience like this is, well, what are you doing about standards? Well, you see, to to service unprepared satellites, there are no standards. We assume that if this all works, right, that the community will suddenly go, hey, we need some standards, and, and that'll start happening. But right now, they're not necessary for any of our functions. Actually, uh, when I talked about the difficulty of uh, refueling and all the steps that are involved in that, that's, that's a demonstration that standards are really necessary. We've identified at least 30 different configurations of fill and drain valves for propellant. And, and our tools have to accommodate all of those. So, so that's, that's really nasty. Um, and it's something that we hope someday is, is taken care of with standards. But standards for modules, you know, standards for, for refueling uh, uh, probe configurations. Um, gas stations would be a lot less nice if you had to have six different nozzles and figure you had, you had to know which one went into your car and that sort of thing. So, so we assume that that will be um, fixed someday. Um, now, I want you to know that all this robotic servicing stuff is not just DARPA ferry does, okay? <laughs> that other people are, are getting, are serious about this. So SSL, our, our commercial partner, as it turns out, but this is a NASA project, um, is looking at the possibility of putting a robotic arm on their commercial communication satellite. Not to service other satellites, but to do things actually on their own satellite. Um, so today, these, these large reflectors, I showed you a picture earlier of the new Dawn satellite had a couple of reflectors on the side. Each one of those has a deployment mechanism, motors and structures and hinges and that sort of thing. They're heavy and they're expensive. What if instead you had a single robotic arm and its job is just to take reflectors off the launch locks, put them in plug. It not only saves costs and weight, but it turns out that you can add more reflectors. Customers like that. So th this is not just an experiment. This is something that um, has, has real appeal to real satellite customers. So here's a, a design of a satellite that normally has four reflectors, but now it's able to have six because of the presence of this robotic arm, which has reduced cost and reduced weight. Um, it, started off, it did start off as a, as, a, as a DARPA seedling, very small one, but now it, was, it is going forward under NASA tipping point program. Uh, and, 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 and imagine now that the synergy between servicing satellites that can move things around in geo and satellites with robot arms on them. So imagine further if the satellite had uh, US, the equivalent of a USB port on it where you can bring up new electronics and that sort of thing. Yes. Yes, they were and they will be the first time. However, there's no reason they have to be, right? So the commercial industry has a problem right now. The commercial communication satellite industry and geo has a problem. They're very happy that the manufacturers are building satellites that last 15 years. But their customer bases on the ground change every five to seven years. So if you're stuck with what you launched with, you, you, you wind up with a white elephant. You have to figure out somebody else you can sell that satellite to. And because these antenna patterns are very custom, they're very bespoke for whatever the customer base they're servicing. They have many, many, many little spot beams and that sort of thing. But if you take the South America one and you move it over to, to, to Africa, it, it may not do a very good job servicing your customers. So imagine if you could, and, and all those patterns are determined by the reflectors. So imagine if you could bring new reflectors up and, and replace them, and, and the presence of this arm would make that, I won't say trivial, but it would at least make it feasible. So, so launching reflectors later is, is a very appealing thing. Um, but that arm could also be used to attach, let's say, a new electronics module to an equivalent of a USB port that was on there as well, and that, that electronics module was, was pretty loose later. Um, now, can we play this? That's the big question. It's only 30 seconds long, it's no great loss, but it actually shows the ground demo of, this, of that arm, that robotic dragonfly arm, picking up a reflector and moving it. 
Do we do we know if this is feasible? We can try it. Yep. Yes. Okay. So there's the end effector. Um, you you can see the gripper there is really a cylinder, and it's it's gone out and it's picked up a reflector. Oh, that was that was it. That was it. <laughs> Thank you. You can do it again. You can do it a second time if you wouldn't mind. We have the technology. I thought I had a 30 second version. This is an 11 second version. Um, but this is this is being done with with uh, NASA funding under their tipping point program, and it's complementary to what we're doing in the um, in the in the DARPA program. And by the way, uh, uh, NASA Goddard also has a robotic servicing program. I, I kind of failed to mention that. It's called Restore L. Uh, uses the same robot arm that that DARPA is using. That was the one that was developed 2005 to 2008. But you can now you can start to see that people are getting more serious about this space robotics stuff. Uh, so why, right? I I think I've 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 harped on the why long enough. We DARPA is helping to get this stuff up there quickly. Somebody uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was actually at a NASA workshop on using in-space robotics for future astrophysics missions, and I'll talk about that in a little bit here. Um, okay, maybe five minutes, Michelle, is that all right? Um, they said, well, this doesn't really seem DARPA hard. And the first thing I said was, well, I take that as a compliment, because we've been working on it for 15 years, so we've gotten to the, it to the point where it's not DARPA hard, that's great. But, but we say, you know, sometimes DARPA invests not because it's DARPA hard, because it's DARPA necessary. You just need to see things move in a new direction, and this, this is like that. Uh, we are investing in making this a sustained capability, so we'll have enough propellant and enough uh, electronic reliability and that kind of thing to make sure we can do dozens of operations over several years. Um, and, and, and by being able to add things in GEO, we want to lower the cost of access, right? If you don't have to integrate your payload, whatever it is, whether it's a meteorological payload or a space weather sensing payload or whatever, you don't have to integrate that with a bus. It should be faster to build, cheaper to build. Uh, and we wanna start thinking about assembly. We wanna start thinking about building things out there, whether they're telescopes or radio antennas or structures where you can hook multiple payloads or whatever. RSGS will actually represent a laboratory where between its servicing missions, you could send up assembly experiments and validate your on-orbit assembly concept. NASA could do it, commercial communications industry could do it, the military could do it. And so the hope is that things keep moving and more and more capabilities are, are established in GEO. Uh, we have invested, DARPA has invested in some modular uh, sub-satellite capabilities. It's called Satlet. Uh, the, co the company that's produced them is NovaWorks out in uh, California. These, these are single degree of freedom reaction wheels that are also energy storage, propellant, and computing and communications, and they can be snapped together seriously like Legos. Seriously like Legos. Um, that's another, maybe another piece of the puzzle about how we do things. Down in the lower right-hand corner is, is an image from NASA of a telescope assembly concept that they've been working on for, for several years. Uh, you can imagine the same sort of thing being used as a, as a huge communications aperture to, to look down from GEO. Um, and someday maybe this, this logistics stuff, um, particularly the development, the delivery of propellant won't be as, as complex as it is today. So that's our vision. And I, I tell, told the industry, I said, hey, this, this is like a newborn baby. You have to feed it. You have to take care of it. It's an industry that doesn't exist yet. We need to work together to share our insights, to share our discoveries, to share our lessons learned, to make this all work, because it's better for everybody. Um, I'm hoping that, and, and DARPA will probably sponsor some um, conferences in, in this area, uh, in, in order to facilitate this information sharing. Uh, I do believe that uh, we're not out of ideas here. We're, we're as a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, so, so many keep coming up at every conference like this that I go to that I'm very encouraged that there's, there's a sort of a mental stimulation that, that this concept of on-orbit robotics and complex operations 
um, fosters. So I look forward to your questions and I thank you very much. Uh, and I thank the organizers for having me. Right, right over here, please. Well, they're online as well. So. Thank you. Good point. Eric Andrews at Goddard um, Space Flight Center. You've uh, called out in this presentation specifically a geo feature. And as you pointed out right near the end of your talk, there's a LEO capability, Restore L, that they're working on at Goddard. And you can envision something that's even beyond geo out at L2 or something down the road. Is this, can you comment a little bit on whether this is an artificial breakout or is there something that specifically has driven you to geo or is it just a handshake with others that they'll get another piece of the pie and this is yours? Can you comment on that? Right, I, un I understand the question perfectly. And I would, I would rephrase it as why are we going to geo? Why do we choose that? There is, an economic motivation to go there for our commercial partner by by doing multiple missions around the geo belt they're they're sustaining their business um, it's a militarily valuable orbit that the top two military satellites the advanced dhf and the space-based infrared system are stationed there so there's a military driver um, and and of course it has this feature that all of the customers are, are on a single <laughs> ring so the amount of propellant that it takes you to get from customer to customer is very small. So that's why we believe we can do dozens of missions. LEO is harder because the orbits are very scattered. You can imagine someday, if people start looking at this, you can imagine preferred geo orbit. If you go in this geo orbit, you'll be able to be serviced. There is a servicer in this orbit where if you choose some other orbit, sorry, it's too hard. It's gonna take 1.2 kilometers a second of delta V to get over there. We're just not gonna spend that on you, right? So um, th that's the way I, I see it moving. It's not so much that um, it will only ever do it in geo, but, I, but there's, a, there's a certain operational uh, change that would have to occur to make it feasible in geo. In terms of L2, and cislunar is another, is another orbit. You know, if we have a deep space gateway out there and we don't have a robotic servicer next to it, that's crazy, right? Because you send things up, and you don't want to have to put RPO sensors and software on every one of the things you send up. You want to have something there that, that captures it, that goes and grabs it and takes it over. So, so there are a lot of places that where this would be valuable. Um, there, are, there are operational considerations that made GEO the logical choice for the first one. Did that? Yeah, Ronnie Kilo, Southwest and Research. You, and then you. Uh, so have you guys looked at, I'm sure you have, uh, the different types of failures that have occurred and sort of been those and, and, and what types of failures are reasonable to be able to be serviced by a technology such as this and which ones are perhaps out of reach or at least for some time? Absolutely. Um, of the, of the types of failures that occur, we can help with very few. We can help with deployment anomalies and propulsion anomalies. That's about it, right? Internal electronics failures, sorry, I don't know what to do for you. I mean, someday, if, if, you, make your pro, if you make your processor an on-orbit replaceable unit, you know, or, your, or some of your, your, your TWTs or whatever that are on-orbit replaceable, then, then I can help you. But, but the way that things are built today that are so highly integrated, it's only uh, the things that we can do externally are, 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 are the things that we're going for. Yeah, so I would think that deployables and propulsion are probably some of the more common failures, I would guess. I don't know if that's true from your study. So uh, uh, five deployment failures in the last 10 years. So every every other year, but the dollar value, you know, very high. Yes, sir. Uh, this is Michael Aguilar from the NESC. Um, I'm looking at your, your, in essence, business plan. You've got a number of satellites that probably have been defunct for some time and, and the ownership might even be a question. I would think that the you would have to have a clear ownership and knowledge in the success of the repair, meaning that they ran out of fuel, you just have to fuel them, they were working before you, they ran out of fuel, that kind of a thing. Um, secondly, there's a lot of interest in CubeSats in this audience. And I would think with the mass 
of this vehicle going out to inspect, that's a lot of fuel where it might be really uh, something that could be supported by a smaller vehicle that would go out and do the inspection for you to make sure that it was going to be worth your while to go out and, and service that vehicle. I understand both your questions. Um, in terms of the business case, um, at, at, down at the end here, um, the, the, the strong business case is for pre-planned refueling at about the midpoint in a spacecraft's life. Um, so, so SSL already has a contract with SES, the world's largest uh, geo operator, to refuel one of their birds after we get, we get up there. So, so the, the, the desire, the business case for that is strong, but it is the pre-planned one. It's not, oh my God, oh my God, it's gonna go away in three weeks if we don't, you know. There, there is a, a, a requirement by the International Telecommun Telecommunications Union that you super sink your geobirds. You don't leave them there to die. Sometimes they die and, and that's a shame, but the requirement is to, to, to get rid of them. Uh, now in terms of the smaller satellite, I completely agree with you, right? I have to spend, you know, let's say 20 kilograms of propellant just moving around to inspect somebody. If I had somebody else that could spend one kilogram to do that same inspection, that would be great. Um, I, I only have so much funding, <laughs> so to, to, you know, there's a certain amount of miracles we're going to do, but not all of them, but that's, that's certainly one that, that, that people, they've even suggested having it tethered so you can kind of, kind of bring it back. Unfortunately, the tether dynamics there make that a little, a little weird, but yes, sir. Hi, Chris Landauer, the Aerospace Corporation. Um, talk about integration. Some of these add-on boxes are gonna leave you with hardware that isn't fully integrated in the sense that pieces are working more or less independently. We're going to need a whole new style of software integration to run those things. Job security. <laughs> I, I wanna write a program and go away from it. <laughs> Just a point that is gonna be of interest to everybody here sooner or later. Right, especially um, when you, you know, put the equivalent of a USB port on the, the outside of a spacecraft. Um, by the way, that, that USB port's already been developed. I, I need something to hold the tools on the outside of our servicer. That tool holder also has power and data feed through. No, 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 no. Uh, it's a launch lock, but it's also reusable. But it also has power and data feed throughs because some of the tools need, need heat and some of them are active. They have, they have circuits in them, so we have to do it. So that same object, that same tool holder, could be integrated into another you know, a new design spacecraft and, and provide you a priori uh, the ability to attach new things. And then you would need the software support for that. Absolutely. Uh, there's a backup question, a follow-up question. I, um, as a software guy, I was appalled to learn how much software there is in the ball bearings. And clearly there's going to be software in everything. So that's part of my issue here. So we think, yes, and we think we're flying on the, on the servicer uh, about, um, 700,000 lines of code. When you, when you look at that, that stack that I had for the, you know, but there's also the, 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 pro, the payload mission manager, there's the, the FDIR and all, all those kind of things, the RPO, something else. So there's a lot of stuff going to fly. Um, I, at, that, at that Italian conference that I went to on communication satellites, I learned about the payloads for these new high throughput satellites. The processor to do all the beam steering and everything. The one design that I saw had 128 connectors and consumed five kilowatts of power. So, um, so, so, so engineering, uh, you know, both, both the processors and, and the software is getting much more complex. Yes, sir. The question for those of you that couldn't hear it was, what is the approximate cost of the spacecraft and the launch? Um, DARPA doesn't usually comment on its budgets, and I won't. And I also, the, uh, the amount that the commercial partners investing, since they're bringing that bus on their own nickel, that's a proprietary number. But, but a typical commercial geocommunication satellite is around $300 million. This will be considerably more than that. Uh, yeah, and, be, and because this one's going to bring a lot of propellant for sale, it's going to be even more massive than a typical one. Um, upwards of, of uh, 7,000 kilograms, actually way upwards, if, you know, depending on most optimistic. So um, we'd like to launch on a Falcon Heavy 
or maybe an Atlas V, five by one or something like that. Uh, we have to do a lot of our own orbit raising because the spacecraft is so massive. So we will have electric propulsion in addition to chemical uh, because that's just much more efficient, but it's not timely. So there's, there's still trades going on in that. Yeah, hi, uh, Brian Rishikoff at Odyssey Space Research in Houston. So we work a lot in rendezvous prox ops for human space flight, which has a lot of redundancy and reliability requirements. Mm -hmm. And clearly that's for human life. And I'm sort of interested in the reliability and redundancy requirements associated uh -huh. with this because of the potential for debris and other complications if things go awry. Absolutely. Um, so we'll fly two narrow field of view cameras and two LIDARs. So those are both redundant. We obviously aren't going to approach if we don't have operating sensors. We simply are out of the game if that happens. Um, in terms of the software, so our, we have a uh, two robotics processing modules. I guess I can't really get into the details of what's what's inside those, but they're they're much more powerful than a typical flight computer because of all this stuff they've got to do. Um, cold cold spare, um, but but we have the ability to, and obviously now. Uh, some of the stuff that we're doing for reliability and prevention of collision has to do with automated action, right? If there's unanticipated motions or that sort of thing, both the arm and the bus will be able to do automated withdrawal. Um, and of course, uh, one of the reasons that, that I think SSL picked Draper to do the RPO is their work on signal. Um, so they, they have the human spaceflight rendezvous and pox ops experience. Uh, uh, way, way back. Oh, you have a microphone. Okay. Yeah, Ziv Ackerling, the Aerospace Corporation. The previous speaker mentioned debris. A lot of you guys here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the previous speaker mentioned debris. Have you looked at this as a platform for active debris mitigation? Um, in, a, in one sense, yes. In another sense, no. So NRL did a spec, spectral survey of objects in the... Um, in the graveyard, a light curve analysis to see what their tumble rates were. And we could dock with 90% of them, roughly. There's about 10% that have angle rates that we don't like. Uh, the question would be, given, given that my particular spacecraft is, is going to be a commercial entity, who will pay them to do anything about moving debris, right? So, so does it have the capability to do that? Sure. I will also point out there are policy challenges there. Um, you, you have to have the launching nation's permission. You have to have the owner's permission. You have to, I mean, so, so moving debris, the, the program previous to mine was looking at taking dead satellites and harvesting components off of them to reuse them, sort of as a demo of these robotic capabilities. The policy challenges to that are, are I mean, we, we have a few. That would have, have more. So, so debris is a really funny thing because of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. I mean, that's, that's really where those policy problems originate because it's it's very ambiguous uh, because it was written at a time when only nation states were doing space and launching and, and, and that sort of thing so so from a technical point of view it's feasible much of the time from an economic point of view it's not clear and from a policy point of view there's there's a lot of work to be done I think thank you very much Dr. Roy. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, the next presentation is from Argentina. The person is in Argentina, and I need to make a phone call from here to dial him in. Uh, so, hang in. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to. <clears throat> Bring, I'm going to bring his uh, slides up first. Person from Argentina. Sure. I could use the restroom first. That would be great.
Is this? That's what but I think about. what happens is this is what we are doing. Okay, this is. Yeah, it's sharing the screen up there for, okay. for, for presentation. Is that what it says in the in the link there? Let me just yeah. take it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There is that. Uh, you see the presenter like this. Uh, so yeah, try, that. try that. Hmm? Let's try that as well. You know that. Yeah, it's there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go back to where you were then. Oh, Dave, you know. Dave, you know. So if he doesn't know, oh, sure the Millennium. Um, so you like CTO. No, 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 no. You're chief technical guy, or, or maybe you're president. Anyway, Millennium did a little bit of work for NRL in um, looking at. Okay. Yeah, Briggs. Mike Briggs. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So I know Mike. It's, it's been a while. That's right. Um, this work uh, is only recently come aware of. Okay. So dialing, we need to go tell them off. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I'll take it. Okay, great friend. Yeah. Remember great Craig Fuller? Yes, I think that would be ask him. So I'm going to dial out. But he also nine? worked, he and I worked together on the Space Star concepts in the early days. Basically, that worked for Seth. We also worked together on the company. I went in 2004, NRL and I went over to talk so, to Seppi about a robotic. I'm rich. Five four five zero. I have to go to five four. I'm 
Por favor, espere un momento. Hello. Hello, can I speak with Gaston? Hello. Oh, hi, is that Gaston Franchi? Yes, here, Gaston Garcia Franchi. All right, well, this is Flight Software uh, Workshop. So you are on here. Um, I'm on your first slide, so whenever you tell me you're ready, we will go. Okay. Um, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you to the Flight Software Workshop Committee to give us this opportunity uh, to present our work. Um, well, my name is Gaston. I'm from Conair, that is the Ashland Dime Space Agency. Um, I am an engineer. That I work with the software for a payload on the Sagdi Aquarius mission. And I'm here with um, other members of the team, that is uh, Roberto Alonso, who is the um, a mission system engineer of the Sabiamar project, and Jose Cuba, who is the mission analyst uh, for the same mission. And I want to mention uh, the another uh, member of the team, that is Nadia Pucci. She was a master student who worked with us as part of her master thesis. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay. Yeah, I, I switched the next slide immediately, but it's going to take some time for you to see that on the YouTube. So you just proceed after oh, okay, the next, okay? Okay. Uh, well, we are going to present an overview of a concept to change the way the mission planning is done today. Uh, well, uh, these are the section of this presentation, and in particular, the um, application to Leo satellite and extension to constellation, uh, those Two uh, sections, uh, I, they are going to be presented by Roberto. <clears throat> Roberto is the person who uh, uh, starts with this, uh, this work. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, I'm on slide three now. Current mission arch architecture. Okay, yes. Uh, well, um, here this is an introduction to show you uh, how the, um, the communication between the mission center and the satellite is done today uh, regarding to the planning, uh, the mission center uh, configurates the plan, generates the telecommand, and then send the, that uh, set of telecommands to the satellite. And for the mission centers, uh, it costs around the 90% uh, of the contact time to send uh, that amount of telecommands. So uh, the satellite finally uh, only executes those commands. And please, next slide. Okay. Next slide. Okay, um, well, here we have the motivation for a change to this way the planning is uh, done. So, um, we know that today um, the hardware has evolved and we currently have enough onboard processing power to be functions to the software. Uh, for example, we can now, uh, if we want, if we want, we can add some functions to onboard 
image processing and also onboard mission planning. Uh, on the other hand, for countries such as Argentina, we have a uh, very little contact time, so uh, we need to optimize that time. Uh, and the idea is to reduce the amount of telecommand that we must transmit from the mission center to the satellite. Um, for example, if the mission requires adding new areas of interest for the mission, uh, for acquiring. Gaston, did you hang it by mistake or are you there? I think something went wrong. Yeah, we're disconnected. Yeah. Hmm? It's not good. That's the right number. Okay. Hello. Oh, hi, Gaston. It looks like um, there was a problem on that call. Uh, from your side, the phone hang up or something. So uh, I'm on slide four now, but I think we have lost a lot of time. So if you could go quickly, that would be good. Okay. Um... Thank you. Hmm? Yes, no problem. No, thank you. Okay, well, um, um, well, the idea is that uh, now uh, we want to add these new functionalities in the flight software, and uh, our first step is to implement an autonomous onboard mission plan. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, Okay. You are in the in number five? Stage? Yes. Uh-huh. Number okay. five. Okay. Well, this is the proposal is to change this paradigm to the mission centers, uh, just uh, monitor or supervise the automatism in the satellite. Well, the satellite will generate uh, the actions to accomplish the mission plan. Next slide, please. Slide six. Okay, uh, well, these are, these are the main functions for the planner. Um, I want to mention something from here is that um, the idea of the planning is to use something uh, that is called a polytop, that is uh, like a polygon, um, and we'll use this. Um, uh, information uh, to generate events when the satellite is um, passing over that uh, area. 
Um, the polytop is a set of points that we define a closed area um, um, in a convex, like a convex polygon. Each point is defined with latitude and longitude value. And in our planner, the polytop will represent the area of interest. Uh, on the surface of the Earth. And so uh, when the satellite is uh, passing through this polytop, you can link different actions, different commands, different scripts to be executed uh, in, this, in that moment. Next slide, please. Slide seven. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, here well, we have another function uh, of the planner. Well, the planner, we need to determine uh, different information from the satellite, that is the position and the attitude. Uh, with that information, the planner uh, must uh, determine, determine what we call sub-points. That sub-point, uh, for example, the sub-satellite point is referred uh, as a point on the Earth's surface that is uh, linked to the nadir vector. And then you can have another two points, like uh, for each instrument you have uh, on the spacecraft, and uh, each sub point will represent that instrument uh, on the Earth's surface. So the idea is that the algorithm that the planner will execute on board will determine the position of these subpoints uh, respect to the different polytops you have uh, on your list, on, on, on your, uh, yes, in your mission plan. So um, when these points enter the polytop, uh, the software will generate different events. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, calibration area. Yes, this is an example of a polytop um, on the surface uh, of the Earth. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Geometrical view. Okay, well, uh, here uh, you can see the, um, uh, a polytop and three sub points. Okay, you have one satellite point, uh, then you have two sub, as an example, sub camera points. Uh, two sub points are inside the polytop and will execute an event that is, is related to, the, to that uh, position. And you have a sub point outside the uh, polytop, and that point will generate another event related to uh, that position. <coughs> Next slide, please. Okay. Closer I'm going very fast for this. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a closer view of the geometry. Uh, here we define four um, events. We call it going, the event when the, the sub point, uh, it, uh, that's the first step inside the polytop. Then you have the go out, that is the first step outside the polytop. And then you have the inside, that are events that uh, when the sub point is traveling inside the polytop. And then you have the outside event. Next, please. The box. Okay, this is not a box around it. the polytop, it's a square and, and the polytop, that's a mistake, sorry for that. Uh, and this is just an optimization for the algorithm that uh, to avoid execute the, all the, proce the process to, 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 to check if the point is inside or not the polytop. Uh, it will use the minimum and maximum the latitude and longitude values of the polytop. So uh, when the sub point is inside that area, the software will start uh, processing the algorithm. 
Uh, the algorithm that uh, we are using uh, is based on the Jordan cube theorem that uh, uh, this uh, theorem, this algorithm, um, just uh, calculate if any point is uh, inside or outside the uh, point. Of Next uh, slide, please. Okay. First version. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is just um, to start the idea of, of how we are developing the software. The idea is that the software is going to be like a library, uh, and uh, we don't want to be fixed to an operating system, um, so the software will not have any uh, system call. And well, the software um, uh, must um, have this functionality, trigger events and alarms, generate reports and telemetry, and execute commands and scripts. Next slide. Okay. Software design. Software design, where well, this is uh, another uh, functions. And here, the most important one is the last one that says the planning table has two operating modes, real time and time target. The idea is that um, this um, software uh, <clears throat> can um, work in real time, that is always doing the the, the processing if the, the subpoints are uh, inside the polytops and then executing uh, the event or a time target um, uh, mode that uh, I will explain in the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, the simple approach. <clears throat> okay, um, the time target uh, mode is uh, very similar. Uh, uh, in what the mission center today uh, does for generate the plan, uh, the mission plan. Um, but in our case, because we are the software is uh, going to be executed on board, uh, the, the software um, need to have functions to propagate the orbit. For example, for today, and uh, we generate a table with all uh, the points where the, um, the satellite or the subpoint, the instrument subpoint, uh, crosses uh, each polytop. So we generate this table and we'll, uh, the software will mix this information with the mission planning table and we generate the time target planning table. That is a set of actions with the time uh, to be executed. Uh, next slide. Okay. <clears throat> it's the continuation slide. Okay. Uh, well, uh, here is just uh, an overview of the blocks. These blocks represent the modules for the software, uh, and that module handles different functions uh, for the planner. Um, here uh, you can see the Jordan uh, block that is the function that calculates the, um, the subpoints uh, and the polytops. Next slide, please. Thank you. The advanced design. <clears throat> okay. Well, this this is related for the orbit part of the planner. The planner need needs to. Um, um, to process uh, some information from the different um, sensors that the spacecraft has. And with extra information, uh, we generate that output data that uh, are the uh, filter orbit and other information that the planner will use to generate the subpoint and to, to do the, this. Um, even predictor or and then target tables. Next slide, please. Okay, the baseline. Okay, well, this is a, a basic design for the satellite, and 
uh, regarding this planner, uh, we are going to have the first test uh, of the version with some restriction. And um, this first version is going to be included in the software of a payload computer in the Sabiamar mission. So now I will let uh, Beto, uh, Roberto, uh, explain uh, this part. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, Sabiamar mission is a, a, an ocean color mission from CONAI and also for the Brazilian Space Agency. And it's a sun synchronous uh, orbit. Night date of revisiting time. The, we have uh, on board three main cameras covering from the ultraviolet bands to the uh, thermal infrared. And um, some part of the mission is, is uh, performed in, in during the ascending uh, orbit and the other descending orbit. So there are a lot of uh, scenarios. There are a lot of, and uh, we are in the in the uh, slide. 18, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, in That's the Saviamar uh, mission uh -huh. case, I'm sorry for. No problem. So I'm on slide 18 now. Okay. Um, the, this is the shape of the, the mission. The mission is starting the CDR next uh, April. So we have most of the uh, studies uh, finished. Next slide, please. Okay. Simulation. Uh, this is a simulation um, of the Saviamar orbit where we have a polytop, the orbit, and the sub satellite point that, uh, with a field of view, is uh, a large field of view of this uh, satellite. So, it's uh, to show uh, the position of the sub, -sat -sub satellite point with respect to the uh, polytop. No, nothing more than that uh, simulation. Uh, the, um, the planner uh, has to uh, pr provide us the possibility to, to use also just um, to, uh, uh, to study the allocation of memory, the contact time. There is a, a spin-off also the, for, from, the, from the mission design. Next uh, slide, please. Slide 20, Constellation. Yes. Thank you. Um, the extension of this uh, this idea to using the polytop in, on, on Earth was to simulate the pos the possibility to have the um, the constellation uh, tune from the idea that uh, from Conai has a, a constellation of four satellites. Um, the the first approach was to uh, cooperative satellites between the master and some slave, uh, just as an idealization with some ground polytop. Both of them are working and sometimes cooperative with the, with the mission. The idea is to have the master, master satellite has the, the less amount of information respect to the, the other satellite to maintain the configuration. It's not important the absolute configuration, just the relative configuration for our needs. We will spend then the, the idea for absolute configuration. The, um, the, the, the space polytop is created of, of, from, from each the satellite that should be involved in the constellation. Next slide, please. Okay, that's continued. On, I'm on slide 21. Mm -hmm. We uh, use the same ideas, the same algorithms. Uh, we, we try to avoid the formulation, the mathematical formulation here, but we, we have all the algorithms ready uh, with the master satellite to use the same idea of entering and leaving the polytop to understand when it's necessary to perform um, orbit calibration for this, the relative uh, architecture between slave and master. The, the same ideas that we use for Earth that um, is uh, in, implemented on Saviamar and is the baseline for the software. I forgot to, to forget to, to mention that the, this planner is uh, already on board of the computer for Saviamar in the payload section. Um, is the baseline for uh, working with the cameras. Uh, we try to avoid 
the amount of uh, time target common because, as Gaston explained, our uh, con contact time from the ground station that is in the center of the country is very small. So we plan to have only um, the, the task of monitoring the automatism uh, of, the, of the satellite. Um, the extension of constellation is for the next satellite, the next mi uh, mission that is a constellation of four satellites. Next slide, please. Yeah, yeah the summary. The summary, uh, Gaston will explain the summary. Okay, well, uh, sorry for the mess. <laughs> uh, we talk, I think, too fast. Um, well, the idea was uh, to show you a similar view of the concept for our autonomous onboard mission planning system. Um, I don't know if you understand something. <laughs> so, uh, well, um, yeah, uh, to conclude, well, the mission center uh, changed its role from being the active vector of the mission to just supervise the actions uh, of the onboard planner. And then the mission plan became like a dynamic document where changes are easy to make and the addition of new polytops uh, should not generate uh, an extra effort in the control center. So if uh, there is a new area of interest for the, the science people, they only need to define the polytop and then uh, the actions to execute uh, for this poly, uh, polytop or area of interest. <clears throat> so uh, the mission center will send the command to configure and to add this new polytop to the planner, the onboard planner. That's the, the idea. Um, so next slide. Questions? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Gaston. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for <laughs> catching up. Also, is there any question or anybody has a question? All right, I don't see any major questions. I think we are, so we were going to skip to the next one. Gaston, thank you very much. Um, we will certainly keep in touch on on the chat from here on, okay? Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. you very much to both of you. Bye-bye. Okay. <clears throat> hang up. All right. So uh, before we get to the break, um, I invited um, Chris Croupiers, who started this uh, workshop on uh, this workshop 10 years ago uh, by just paying for some two pizzas or something like that. <laughs> He's right here. Um, we would like to rec uh, recognize his effort. And I have uh, our group supervisor, uh, our branch supervisor, Brian Duncan, right here. Uh, Brian, go ahead. Right, thank you. Thank you, Sabod. Uh, this will only take a minute. I know uh, we're scheduled for a break before we get on to the panel discussion, but I wanted to share with you a quick quote before we recognize Chris for his effort. Uh, and this is from Steve Jobs. You have to be burning with an idea or a problem or a wrong that you want to write. If you're not passionate enough from the start, you will never stick it out. And this, when I reflected upon this opportunity to recognize Chris for initiating the Flight Software Workshop, I wanna recognize his passion, his leadership, and his dedication to the flight software domain and to a lot of the capability for our missions that that enables. Uh, I love to see everybody come together, share their ideas and their experience. Uh, we can be competitive at times, but we can work together at times, and it, it's wonderful to see. So I uh, would like to offer this very nice and very heavy uh, gift to Chris Krupiars to recognize uh, initiating the Flight Software Workshop 10 years ago. So a round of applause for Chris.
anybody remembers that first uh, that first year when we had like three different kinds of pasta that all tasted the same? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say thanks to everybody for showing up again. And I mean, it's the people that show up that obviously make the workshop. If we had had five people show up that first year, we wouldn't have ten of them. Seven of them, I guess. So I appreciate everybody showing up. So both Alan, Amaya, everybody who's taking control of the the workshop over these many number of years. And of course, all the support that we see from our administrative staff on. Uh, and Marjorie Reardon, you remember her back in the day. She was a key. She was just as important that first year in terms of getting everything in place. And just really appreciate all the support there. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, shall we take a 10 minute break and come back here, say around 1030 or so? Thank you. Bye. the microphones with them. Okay, but between the four of us, okay. oh, I see, we, we don't have a handheld, it's just the... So we need to, you know what? You think it's easier to do the handheld? So these can move, right? Easy. This can move. No, these can move to people. Oh, you're saying you for audience, so gotcha. So what I will okay. do is I'll ask them to do the... Okay. Those if they can. We don't have two of these, I guess. Right? I have two of those, because but, but one you, you, is... So let me ask. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Anything. I'm, it's just going to be pure panel. So, so if you want, I'll just throw one slide right. Okay, on. that's fine. If you want to just put up a you know some chop slide or you know, I'll just just. Yeah, that's. Right. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But do we need to stream switch now? Uh, we should otherwise we'll have to do it uh, later when we is when did you start the stream? I don't remember. So you want to see? Go ahead, check the stream. Yeah, well if you start at like eight eight thirty, then start. by by or 
four thirty. I think we were going to cut it off. No, no, no. So we should switch, but we, I thought we can do that at twelve o'clock. Oh, right. Yeah, I forgot it's two thirty now. Okay. Good. <clears throat> yeah. I'm just putting up the slide. You need to start. No, no, no. I was just going to talk to you off, off yeah. the mic. Yeah. Okay. If you want, I can follow the YouTube chat and raise my hand if there's any questions. Yes. So you need to discuss that with Adrian. Oh, okay. All right. So, okay. <laughs> um, no, so what I was going to do is, I have a couple. Of, I have some questions that I was going to draw. Start the conversation. Stimulate conversation. I'm hoping I can get questions from the audience to have those go, but I've got things to keep the conversation going or whatever. So I'm going to start off having each of the panel introduce themselves and start off with just a potential thing and see if they can throw out some questions so we can really discuss. Oh, I see. Right, because I'm standing here the whole time. Okay, so I can just see. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. That's correct. Yes. Um, I have the names. Yeah. Yeah. First, and last one. All right. Perfect. So, Next is the. Uh, I don't think. Oh, I had one thing. I was going to ask. Yeah. I just want you to answer my question. Did you want to No, no, no. Have question for you. This is the last one before. Oh, okay. Right. Have one on the okay. That's what I think. Okay. I confirm that, but I think that is what it is. Okay. It was like we had failed half an hour. Okay. 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 <clears throat> so, Dave? <clears throat> Teach me this. Okay, so use presentation view is over, right? So, how do you do this? Just click the thumbnail. That's it. Yeah. Agent, you're good to know. Yeah. Just save it. Can you see it? Can you save it? Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, save. All right. So now, if you need to click like that, I can put up the chat so window. Oh. Yeah. So if we put the chat window, it's going to show up there, though, right? Oh, we got the, the WebEx. Uh, I think I oh, I know what's going on. Is that a black hole? Oh, that's interesting, dude. Right, so I'll be able to see. Okay. okay. All right. Good morning. If everyone, <coughs> excuse me, if everyone could take their seats, we're about to get started. Okay. 
Oh, did you want to look on? Yeah. Right here. We were just looking for you. We're trying to figure out. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Adrian Hill. I'm an engineer here at EPL, and I work uh, a lot. Of, I'm currently the autonomy lead for the Parker Solar Probe mission. We're going to have a panel discussion here uh, for the next next hour, hour and a half, to just talk about autonomy and, and its role in, in flight software and, and how it's progressing and, and how we can move forward. Um, we have a very distinguished panel, and I was going to have the, each panel member introduce themselves. Uh, so we'll just start to my closest, Lorraine, and then we'll go down the line. Okay, hi, I'm Lorraine Fesk. I work at the Jet Propulsion Lab, and uh, I, I wear a number of hats. At JPL, I'm the division technologist, and Scott Burley, by the way, in the corner there is my deputy. Um, for the for the systems engineering and formulation division, um, I also am the lead for NASA's software architecture review board, sponsored by Mike Aguilar, who's sitting right there, um, and and I'm also the lead for the NASA fault management community of practice. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Alice Bowman. I work here at the Applied Physics Laboratory. I'm group soup of the Space Mission Operations Group and also the Mission Operations Manager for New Horizons. So I um, use the autonomy system. Hi, I'm Ronnie Kilo, Southwest Research Institute, uh, Program Director there. Um, uh, just recently finished uh, launching in LEOPS of the Cygnus mission, a constellation of eight microsatellites. Uh, we had some autonomy on that spacecraft. Uh, currently working on Europa Clipper, the mass spectrometer instrument on Europa Clipper, and uh, several other odds and ends. Hi, I'm Bruce Zavadkin. Um, I'm from Goddard Space Flight Center. I've spent uh, most of my career at Goddard, uh, leading flight software teams mainly. Um, I'm currently uh, working on the, the W-1st mission, mission, which is uh, Goddard's next big mission, um, but we're in phase A. Uh, previously to that, I wor I've worked on the JWST ISOM flight software and uh, also um, on the NICER mission, which we just launched and uh, put into operation this past summer. Um, I've also worked uh, here at APL for a number of years, a couple of years, and uh, uh, at Orbital Sciences for a few years, and then returned to Goddard in, in 2006. All right, thank you. Uh, so this is meant to be a, you know, an interactive uh, uh, session. So I'm gonna ask some questions, but we also encourage questions uh, from the audience. We have folks with microphones around, so as you have questions, we get the discussion, please feel free to raise your hand and ask questions. But I was going to start with, uh, you know, a definition of what is autonomy because it, you know, it means many things to many different people. And this is a definition that I heard that, that I really like. Uh, so I'll read it. It's pretty short, but it says, autonomy results from delegation of a decision to an authorized entity to take action within specific boundaries. An important distinction is that systems governed by prescriptive rules that permit no deviations are automated but they are not autonomous. To be autonomous, a system must have the capability to independently compose and select different courses of action to accomplish goals based on its knowledge and understanding of the world itself and the situation. So if you think about, about cruise control in a car, if I set cruise control to 65 miles per hour, that is automated but it's not automation, right? But if I have adaptive cruise control that is adjusting the speed and varying the speed based on environment and situation and cars and traffic, now we have something that's autonomous. Um, so I'm gonna start kind of with a first question and, and you only have one minute to answer. You're not allowed to blabber and go on. It's gotta be short. But describe in your organization right now, um, how you currently do autonomy, if you will, or autonomous operations, if it's kind of traditional rule-based, if you have some artificial intelligence. I'm just going to go down the line, and it has to be short and sweet. I'll start with Lorraine. <laughs> I 
<laughs> short and sweet is yeah. hard to answer yeah. that question. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I led a strategic plan for JPL to figure out what JPL should do in autonomy. And I have so much to share with that. Um, but let me try to answer your question directly. First of all, I would recommend that people try not to use the word autonomy because it's overloaded, because it means so many different things to so many different people. But maybe we could use autonomous as an adjective and then describe what you're making autonomous. Autonomous path planning, autonomous scheduling, autonomous fault management. And, and, it, it, and it might clear up some of the language that we're using today. So, so at JPL, we just sort of have, we have so, so many different pockets of autonomy. Um, certainly our, our robotics group is one of the, one of the largest areas um, I, I think about it as three legs. We have our, our guidance and control and navigation people doing autonomy. Um, whew, I just used the word autonomy. <laughs> you, you use, uh, doing autonomous guidance, navigation, and control, uh, autonomous um, control for robots. Um, we have another area that does artificial intelligence, so doing autonomous mission planning and scheduling, machine learning. Uh, we have some machine learning that has been put onto one of our rovers to look at, uh, look at science objects and recognize them in order to figure out what to shoot the laser at on the Curiosity rover. And then the third leg is the systems engineering and fault management area. So we're coming up with new ways to do fault management and figuring out how to engineer an autonomous system, which is different from engineering how we do it now, where we engineer for manual operations. Thank you. What was the question? Right. Just, uh, <laughs> uh, just in, in your organization, how 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 do you perform autonomous operations currently? <clears throat> so here at APL, um, being on the operations team, I think of autonomy in three different ways: fault management, operational autonomy, and event-based autonomy. And um, I've used up my minutes, so I'm going to have to. <laughs> so I'll give a couple of examples um, of autonomous operations. One is in the area of fault management, which is really uh, more traditional rule-based uh, type autonomy. Um, we do have, uh, that I'll maybe talk about some, the uh, uh, sort of a fault recovery, even the event of a reboot and, and doing an autonomous recovery back to science operations instead of a fail safe, fail operational, if you will. Um, and then another area of autonomous uh, operations is work that we're doing now on the um, Europa Mass Specs instrument, where we're working on a technique for the instrument to uh, autonomously tune itself um, in, in situ. So at Goddard, we don't normally use the term autonomy. I mean, I think mostly for our in-house missions, we, we talk about fault management. Um, and it's very role-based. You know, in fact, we have um, we, you know, we hand system engineers spreadsheets, which they fill out, you know, with what they want done, you know, based on telemetry monitors. And uh, we have tools that turn those spreadsheets into flight table loads. Um, on JWST, we're flying a JavaScript engine, which is being used for operations, uh, not for fault for fault management. Um, I thought there was another thing I was going to point out, but it's not jumping out at me. So it'll come back. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Anyone uh, from the audience have anything in this area before we move on? All right. Um, so so what, one area uh, we've talked about, you know, and it's been talked about for, for many years, we, a lot of times we associate autonomous operations with fault, fault management oftentimes in our spacecraft. But uh, if you heard folks uh, mention on the panel, um, there's certainly been a move into areas, whether it be, if you say, automating operations, or, or as Lorraine described, you know, autonomously identifying a rock and, and making these decisions on board. Um, I think we've been a little slow. I mean, it's been slow moving in that direction. You know, it's, it's, it's something that's been talked about you know, everyone seems to do fault management at some type of autonomous level, but then those additional 
um, science um, type operations on board. Um, you know, I've seen, you know, I think some organizations are a little more or skittish or, or there's always concerns about that. And I was wondering, and I'll start with Lorraine, for, for some of the operations outside of fault management, beyond fault management, um, kind of what are some of the techniques or tools or, or processes that are used to, to, to implement more than just fault management, say, in, in spacecraft software on board? To implement more autonomous More autonomous, it's more than just fault management based. Yeah, so uh, at JPL, we have a technology that does autonomous planning and scheduling. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we put it on a Goddard spacecraft, the uh, EO-1 spacecraft. Um, it was called the Autonomous Science Experiment. So it, is, it has the capability to um, detect, detect certain um, images coming. It's, it's Earth orbiting, so it's looking at the ground. And it detects um, differences between this orbit and the previous orbit. And, and can, it can either redirect how it's pointing or can direct some uh notify some assets on the ground to to look at that difference as well so i think that's one of the larger islands that i described earlier that we have that jpl is planning and scheduling technology um right. in addition as i mentioned we have some machine learning and um, definitely some of the adaptive control systems that are being developed for the robotics. We, had a, we have a Robo Simeon that was in the DARPA Grand Challenge, the DARPA Robotics Challenge, sorry, um, that was supposed to semi-autonomously traverse through a, a debris field, open doors, turn wheels, drill a hole. So some of that was was autonomous. I, I did have a follow-up uh, on that. So when you get into those types of autonomous operations that are maybe more goal-oriented type um, operations from a classical verification and validation and, and requirements and writing requirements. Do you find that the, do you pull requirements at a higher level and say, hey, here's the goal that the system is, is trying to reach or your requirements look more classical, you know, decomposed at the lower level? That's one of the questions that, that someone asked as we move towards. Yeah, and I think that, that is the key question to ask. As we move toward more autonomous capabilities, how do we ensure that it is correct, that it's making the right decisions? I loved your definition, mm -hmm. it, as in it's, it's, it's making a decision. Right. So we have to figure out how it's making the right decision. And I don't, I'm not going to claim we have answered that. Uh, a lot of what we've flown have been experiments and we test them out gradually and kind of let the leash out slowly <laughs> to make sure that it's working and we get comfortable with it. Uh, we have an ongoing program right now at JPL called Assurance of Autonomy to help us make sure that the, uh, the autonomy um, architecture that we're developing is, is, is going to have some method for BNB. Um, but it's, it's a tough nut to crack. Yeah. In my simple mind, I think about how control systems work, where they take sensor inputs, they make a decision, and then they send a command out. And we don't check the out the com every command that comes out of that control system now. And I think if we can use that analogy for autonomous systems, where we're not checking every command that's coming out of it, but we're checking and verifying and validating the guts of the decision maker, then we have a chance of of getting yeah. to the point where we are confident that this is going to work. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Alice, I had a uh, question for you. And Alice is a mission operations manager for the New Horizons mission to Pluto. Um, and that is, as mission operations, what are things you as an, as an operator of the spacecraft would like to see the industry moving towards you know, to have more automated? We think, oh, OK, well, obviously, this would make your job easier. That would make your job easier. What, from your view, um, would make your life easier as an operator of a spacecraft? Oh, okay. um, with uh, the spacecraft um, getting more um, points that are telemetered to Earth, I mean, there's a huge amount, 10,000, on the order of 100,000 
points that come down. So I think one of the big things that would really help mission operations is some kind of an autonomous evaluation of uh, the data that's that's coming down, and perhaps it's done on board, oh. and it's it's translated uh, to Earth in some form, or an analysis of some plotting functions. Um, now I don't know. I don't think we have any plotting functions on the spacecraft yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's something to help with that huge amount of data. Kind of like plotting, trending, and data reduction exactly. of onboard data, so that you can more easily assess the health of the spacecraft. Yeah, exactly. Um, also, one other thing that I might add, and it, this might be just indigenous to the spacecraft here at APL, um, we have a rule Q. So we can see the, 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 the rules that have fired and the MET that they fired at, but currently that Q is um, only about five or so deep for fault rules. And um, you know, when we have a safing event, um, we get way more than five rules that fire. So that would be helpful um, because what, what happens is if you are in a safe mode, you're at a very low bit rate. And if you've got a deep space mission, you've got a very long round trip light time. And so in order to query the system to give you that uh, number of rules that have fired um, takes a long time. So it would be a lot uh, quicker for us to evaluate more specifically what's going on in the spacecraft if we had a, a deeper queue. Well, I mission. should mention with the mission you're on, which is, you know, fairly unique probably for most of the missions, but you've got more than an 11 hour round trip light time, right? For, so yeah. it's a little different than a lot of our other missions. So that's, a, it, which brings different challenges and, and where automation can really help. Um, Ronnie, I had a question from a, 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 at a program management level, what would make program management feel comfortable moving forward, putting more autonomous operation on board you know, versus the risk of not having this deterministic, hey, I know if A happens, B is going to be the response. You know, what? Well, I think part of it gets into the question uh, that you asked Lorraine, which is um, having a, a a clear definition of how you're going to verify and validate in this in this context, validate is probably a more yeah. appropriate term. Um, and, and not only how are you going to validate that autonomy, um, but also, sorry, I used the road, you didn't want me to use the rain, but, um, uh, but also what your fallback positions are, because those are, that's also important. Um, we're dealing with that currently, even on, on the mass specs program where, um, we want to, um, you know, there's, it's an iterative algorithm of trying to, uh, in, in one case, uh, optimize the peak shape that's being produced by the instrument, but at some point, you, you have to uh, reach a point of it's good enough, or you may reach a point where I'm not going to get there, I'm going to fall back to my default configuration. And so uh, I think what would make me feel better from a program management perspective is having a clear definition of what those, um, um, what those validation approaches are and what those fallback positions are and how we know when to fall back to those positions. So you're, you're not going to get to uh, the, the type of shall requirements that we're all accustomed to but we do need to uh, make progress in knowing how to specify these things so that we can reach that comfort level. And so I think there's work to be done in that area of how do we, you know, we're all sort of moving in that direction, but, but um, we're all so used to the more traditional systems engineering approaches and, and to requirements. What, what new ways of specifying these things uh, can we come up with that may have broad applicability of various, uh, across various types of autonomy? And a question for Bruce, and it kind of follows a little bit with what Ronnie was saying. I make it back to him as well. And that is, what do you think about the feasibility of having, and someone that's this kind of maybe a hybrid approach where you have this forward thinking, advanced onboard, smart system that makes decisions, but maybe having a traditional system as the fallback to, to that if things don't go right, you've got something that's, that's more deterministic as a, almost as a fallback or a, I don't want to use the word safe mode, but as a, you know, as a, as a safe haven to drop to, to try to, to try to build confidence that you have a, you know, a system that's still, you know, viable, but still be able to put advanced technologies on board. What do you think the feasibility is of something like that? I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, on W first, we've talked about using our scripting engine, which typically we've used just for operations, but there's nothing that keeps us from using that for monitoring onboard systems. And because it's designed for um, 
uh, you know, to be uploaded, scripts could be uploaded quickly. Um, uh, you know, we can be very uh, responsive to, you know, to, to issues. So yes, I think, I think it does make sense. And we might, you know, we might move forward with something like that. Can I add something yes, to that? So um, I, I've been talking with some some engineers from ESA, as a matter of fact, and they've developed a spacecraft that's supposed to launch next year called OPSAT, O-P-S-S-A-T. And it is designed to allow people to upload new software to control the spacecraft and to test out new new ground operations paradigms, new commanding paradigms, new control paradigms. And wrapped around it is this robust FDIR package so that if the experiment that you upload starts causing harm, it will stop it. So I think it's right. an example. It's a living is, example is, yeah. of, of being able to do that multi-layer, right. make sure that it's that the autonomous part is not going to do anything stupid or it or dangerous right. so it, it's it's possible right. and i That's think it, if we're going to see if it really works right. after it launches i had a question and really for the whole panel and that is um one thing that these higher level systems may require is more computational power and i was wondering if anyone has any kind of real world experience with you know as we add more higher level smarter autonomous intelligence on board if computational power becomes an issue uh, as far as processing power and whatever is needed to run that. Well, it, it, it does. And it's, and it's really factors in with the things that we've already been talking about in, in, in the trade space of, of how much uh, autonomous operations that you can afford um, on board. But even in this sort of qualitative assessment of, of the results of your uh, autonomous decision making, um, I'll go back to uh, something again that we're actively working on mass specs is um, running the algorithm to tune the instrument um, so far it doesn't appear that it's going to be computationally limit, uh, limiting factor if you run it once <laughs> or twice <laughs> or maybe 10 times. But um, how many times can you afford to, to run the algorithm to further optimize that peak shape uh, comes into play. And so you have this, it factors into this point at which you decide that it's good enough. So good enough uh, doesn't just have to do with it's good enough for what we need to do scientifically, but it has to be good enough because we only have so much energy available to us to uh, uh, in that phase of the orbit to tune the instrument. And so we have to sort of have a hard cutoff. Okay. Uh, is, is the good enough to determine on board or is that something that's been pre-canned on the ground that this is the threshold for good enough. I didn't know if that's something. Well, it's, it, it's sort of both. Okay. Uh, there's there's uh, sort of a, you know, a peak shape that we're trying to get to, of course, but then there's some wiggle room around that. And, and the, uh, you know, the decision on board is going to have to be, uh, are we able to achieve what we're close, something close to what we're really uh, desiring? Or if we can't, did we fall so short of it that we're better off with sort of our fallback default or, hey, this is better than our fallback default. Right. So that's sort of where the, the wiggle room is. And, and again, computational power factors into that because it dictates um, in, in the form of available energy how long we can afford to continue to tune before we have to bail out. Right. Right. We've got a question, I believe, in the audience. Yeah. Oops. This is Mike Aguilar uh, from the NESC. One of the questions, I'm right in the middle of this. There is a, on some launch systems right now, they're removing the guy with the big red button for range control and safety and replacing it with an autonomous flight termination system. And I just finished a big static analysis on a piece of that software. And I'm working through that. How can we agree to that in terms of criticality and safety? And I guess my general question is, do you guys have a sense for, Historically, NASA has used autonomy in operations, and as it matured in operations, it moved up to flying on the system and then moved up maybe maybe to a crewed system. Is that is there some kind of TRL type approach that you guys envision for for maturing this so that we get some concept of trust in this autonomy system? Everybody can answer it once. <laughs> Um, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, from an operational point of view, the, <clears throat> the biggest concern or, I guess, uh, lack of confidence 
is um, with these autonomous sy systems that are very complex, getting enough test time to prove that make you feel like it's actually going to react in the way that you want it to react. So I think that's a, a big concern. And I know when we're in integration and test, there's always this push-pull and um, between operators, software developers, and uh, how much time do we give that test? Um, and, and so I think if we can figure out maybe a better way to test so that we can maybe verify more of the system rather than the individual pieces, that this would help to elevate or move that autonomy, more autonomy into, into flight. Uh, I think your notion of sort of a TRO level for a, uh, autonomous operations is sort of an interesting concept. And, and you know, uh, just a, a small part of how that might play out would be uh, sort of the old practice of when you introduce a new system, you run both systems in parallel. Uh, and and in, in the case of the example that you brought up would be, um, well, let's let the autonomous uh, red button run, but it won't take any actions. It will just tell us what it would have done. And, and run that for, you know, some number of, of actual launches where you've still got the real human red button. I think you probably wouldn't ever want to get rid of the human red button, I don't think. But that would, and going to, to, uh, to Alice's point, you, um, you gain confidence in it over time that, wow, that the system is making the same decisions that, that the operator would have made, or you learn that it, it, it is not because obviously here you have kid and this is always true in autonomous operations, especially in fault management. We even learned some of these lessons on, on the Cygnus mission that you can shoot your foot off, <laughs> you know, and I'll make this point in my talk uh, later today where sometimes the system in, in, in the case of your example might destroy the rocket and you look back, it's like, no, it didn't need to do that. <laughs> you know, and you just lost a lot. Of right. The reason I bring this up, the reason I bring this up is I was involved in dealing with grants for autonomous systems at one time. And I asked the, the grant board, and this is to everybody, one of the problems with these autonomous systems is you use artificial stimulation or experiments to test your autonomy out that is not real data, which puts you at about TRL level three or something like this. Now, we re NASA releases science data to everybody on the web but we don't release telemetry streams, which would be great for working through this, we don't get enough test time, we don't have real data. For example, if I, if I were to go with the Kepler data for its failing momentum wheels, and you could analyze that with some system that said, yeah, I know it's gonna fail, so that you could say I used real data, now you're at TRL of mid six maybe. Um, I, I'm just wondering, I, I'd like any discussion, you can come up to me afterwards, and say, would that be really valuable? And I'll, I'll pursue getting some of that telemetry data released. One other thing I'll add is that we're also looking at assurance cases, building and, and running assurance cases uh, in the reliability area to make sure that our autonomous system can't do bad things. There's a question in the back. Is there was there another question in the audience? There's two of them back there. Oh, okay. Yep. Is anyone on the panel running Monte Carlo cases to try to set up random or quasi-random scenarios to look for weak spots in autonomous systems? Um, I can't speak in detail, but I know that uh, our guidance and control system runs Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo simulations um, for various things that the system's going to do. I was going to say that's the most common of, of running Monte Carlos and, you know, attitude determination control and identifying, you know, outlier cases. And, and that might help guide you, for example, in uh, fault type autonomy. But it's kind of an interesting thought of, of, um, uh, of an approach to uh, validating an autonomous system, which would be to um, identify all the variables, if you will, that you know, all the things that could happen, and then running that through Monte Carlo. I think that's kind of a that's sort of a compelling idea uh, that I hadn't thought of before. 
right. Have a question uh, here. One of the hard parts of doing Monte Carlo on software is it's very crunchy, and all of your continuous intuition is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Did you have a question back there? All right, we got one more back here. I was just going to say that I remembered when we were talking about what were the performance requirements in the early days of the high performance, the HPSC. There actually is a presentation which I've seen in three or four forms, and I found it online, detailing the things that could be done based on how much computing power you've done. And there are a number of autonomous uh, tasks like guidance and control, terrain avoidance, more processing on board. But there's, and but it's all broken down into how much computing you would need, and it was going into the requirements for HPSC. So, I mean, it's out there a lot. Hmm. I mean, uh, Raphael Soam is who I remember having it. All right, thanks. Um, we've talked a little bit about, about validation. I was wondering if anyone on the panel had any experience using formal methods for validation for, for large autonomous systems. So I'll kind of throw that out and see if there's any sharks will bite. Um, let me think. We, we, we do have the spin tool at JPL that Gerard Holtzman developed. He's now retired, but he, he started JPL's laboratory for reliable software. And, uh, and we have used that on a number of software packages, including the Mars Science Laboratory. Um, which I would say has minimal capabilities mm -hmm. to do autonomous functions. Um, but I think that is a, a, a good path to take um, as we develop our software. We should, and I think that sits alongside of the assurance cases, bringing, mm -hmm. bringing formal methods in, certainly static analysis, runtime analysis, and then, and then the assurance cases. I think we have to tackle this a number of, in a number of different directions to make sure we get the whole package put together and, right. and get it to a point where we're comfortable that the software is correct. I did have a, a follow-up on that. For the, on the for formal methods, as far as com computational time, I'm talking about on the ground time, running uh, those tools. Have you found that to be a, a big hurdle, just the, the processing re required on the ground to, to run cases? I, I think the hardest, uh, the, the most time-consuming part is Converting your 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 concepts into Promella, right? Right. So so and then coming coming up with what what you want to prove, yeah. And then converting it to Promella right. language. So and that's all ground and that's all ground based right, right. actions. So so I, I I had mentioned that we have a, uh, a an initiative at JPL to 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 do assurance of autonomy, and it, it, we aren't there yet. But next year we're going to be integrating some of those formal methods into our into our initiative. Okay. We do have one question in the back there, Dave. Hi, uh, mostly a comment rather than a question. Um, just want to um, say that at NASA IBMV, we've been experimenting with uh, uh, GPU accelerated Monte Carlo simulations. And uh, it's been, uh, steep learning curve, but uh, there are some challenges, especially in the way, uh, maybe some future work in which, the, in the way the flight software is designed. So uh, to be able also to apply GPUs in autonomous um, flight, that's something that we should be thinking about. Are you saying to fly GPUs or use them on the ground to do the Monte Carlo sims? Both. To be able to do Monte Carlo simulate GPU accelerated Monte Carlo simulations on flight software, you need to find the, the code that can be parallelized, so they can be massively, uh, and so you can be, make use the, of the GPU in the most efficient way. And that requires some thinking in the way the flight software is designed. If you take this a step further, is okay, what if I want to put a GPU in space? Uh, what kind of changes do I need to make to the flight software to be able to run? these processes in parallel and so on. One of the, one of the uh, things that you can do is, for instance, to do in-flight, real-time data analysis for scientific instruments using GPUs. Uh, most of the time, and you know, uh, send to the ground just the data that you're interested in to, if you apply some you know, basic first-generation machine learning techniques, algorithms, you can analyze the, your data in, in the spacecraft, on the GPU, 
And then if you have like short amount of time for communication, like for example, CubeSat, you can just send to the ground the data, the, your GPU uh, as deemed uh, valuable for the science, like you know, early warning systems for, I don't know, forest fires, for example. That's an example. So are you saying the IVMV facilities looking into that? Well, we, we, we got a SARP, uh, a small SARP grant, and we're building up uh, our test bed. So it's a, the, uh, the embryonic stage at this point. But we're thinking, <laughs> <laughs> we're actively thinking about, and uh, maybe next year we're going to have some, something to show. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? I was going to switch gears a little bit. First, I was going to go back to uh, Alice with a question on the operations side. And, and you gave an example of something that, that would help your job operating a spacecraft. But are there other things that we could do autonomously that would, that would move towards what I would call the lights out type operations that reduces operational costs as far as capabilities on board that would reduce the level of effort it would need to maintain a mission? Um, I think that for Earth orbiting spacecraft, um, there are definitely more options available. Um, and just speaking from an APL point of view, um, with all the cost cutting that has been going on with you know the proposals and mission costs, um, we have personal experience with how this cost cutting has really, in my mind, set back a, you know, autonomous functions. Um, an example is the timed spacecraft, T-I-M-E-D. And um, that is uh, an Earth orbiter at about 600 kilometer um, in altitude. And it has a GPS on board. So what this allows it to do, and obviously a lot of flight software probably more flight software than you would normally have on, an, on a spacecraft. But what this allows the spacecraft to provide to the instruments that are on board the spacecraft are um, certain events that happen like equator crossings or polar crossings or um, you know different, different things like that. And the uh, system, the timed uh, telemetry, will put out some flag on the, on the bus and the instrument to have the option of going in and grabbing those flags and when it's set to true, they can start an event or data collection. Um, I don't know of any other spacecraft, well, I know that APL, we don't have that because GPS is kind of expensive to put on and this spacecraft was developed back in the late 90s. Um, it was launched in 2001. The thing that it does for operations, which is very, very nice is it um, knows where the APL ground station is and we have a backup site, not APL, but we can, we, it's in the software. And it allows the transmitter to be triggered to an on state and an off state so it knows when to send data down. So that alleviates a lot of planning on, on the operations side. So, yeah. It's, right. I was gonna ask the same question for Bruce because um, at Goddard, I know you, you have a lot of low earth orbiters so you have a lot of fast but rapid contact type of spacecraft and i didn't know um, what things could be done to more automate that and reduce uh reduce cost for operating the missions or what experience you have in that area i'm not sure i know <laughs> i think yeah i don't i don't i don't uh, have a lot of experience with how uh how we're operating spacecraft these days let me talk to that from us. Uh, our Cygnus experience a little bit is a constellation of eight microsats. So when you've got multi multiples of them, it really starts to get, uh, it can get out of hand very quickly in terms of the uh, burden on the ops team. Um, and um, so one of the things that we, we did on the Cygnus spacecraft was that we um, had autonomous um, uh, ground contacts, autonomous playback of the recorders, um, and it was, um, implemented a way that was relatively flexible so that if a pass was missed, it didn't matter. It would just pick up next time. And the one issue that we, we had was um, in, in that autonomy is, is more work needs to be done in knowing exactly when to start playing back the recorder because you can get energy up to the spacecraft. You can detect that energy. You can 
uh, begin the playback, but you, you wind up either being too conservative in when to start initiate the playback so that you don't lose data on that contact. Um, or if you try to push the limits and get as much as you can out of that pass, then you risk starting to uh, dump the recorder too early. And so there's, there's a little work there to help smooth that, I think would be a big help to the ops team because then if you miss data, then that's more burden on the ops team because they have to then do retransmit requests later on and use up future pass time. Did you I have can, something I'll raise my own hand. Can oh, I raise oh, okay. Go <laughs> for the Goddard question? Um, oh, I mean, we have the teachers tracking data relay satellite system. Oh, right. So a lot of that scheduling is done on the ground, and it's also a cost fee for service type thing. So it's depending a, I'm on sorry. how long you went. You said it's a cost. I mean, you pay for your service. Oh, so amount of, uh, yes. so it depends on your contact schedule, and a lot of that's worked out on the ground. There have been some times at uh, GPM I worked on. I was the flight upper lead. And, they talked about trying to push some of that on board, but it didn't right. seem the, the complication Wasn't, on board didn't seem to buy you anything. Gotcha. Um, but there are two areas that I'm aware of. I like on XTE was another one that had two high gain antennas. And we did put the autonomy on board to switch between the antennas and their line of sight to the different communication satellites. So that was all handled yeah. on board as opposed to on the ground. And then the other thing that um, I think our comms people are working on is something called a user initiated service from the satellite. And that's something that TDRS is adding possibly. And if anybody's involved in TDRS, I'm speaking just on the edge of my knowledge here. So, <laughs> but I know there's um, some, you know, some technology work being done for a user initiated service to go ask for service from TDRS. But that's in the early, very early stages. I guess I have a couple of thoughts on that. One is that I, I do see more benefit from the Earth orbiting missions. I want to go back to your definition though mm -hmm. and make sure we're talking autonomous operations right. or is it really automated? Yeah, that, that, that's I think a lot of the point. lights out for earth orbiting is automated. There's not really decisions right. being made, but right. but the control is on board to when to turn the transmitter on, you know, when, when you have a ground pass. Right. Um, as we as we move out in, into deep space, that lights out operations gets a lot harder because we're dealing with so much so, so many unknowns and, and dynamic environments. I mean, certainly when we're controlling our rovers on the surface of Mars, we have a lot of interactions with the surface that we can't predict. There's, there's slip and there's slide and, and, and we don't often get to our waypoints when we think we will. Um, we're, we also have a mission on, on the drawing board to land something on Europa, which we don't even have a good map of Europa right now. So that's that's very very, very challenging. One other aspect about lights out is it, it, we have we have a system set up at NASA where often a spacecraft is contracted to the lowest bidder for phases A through D. <laughs> And so there's no incentive for the contractor to put more smarts on board in order to save phase E costs. And point. until we get past that, I, right. I, I don't know, that's a hard nut to crack. I, I don't know how to add more complexity, more software, more capability that could right. benefit later phases if, if it's not looked at from an end to end perspective. Right. Yeah. Yep. And thank you, Lorraine. That that it's great. And I'm I, I think I feel like I'm speaking to the choir. Um, when you've got a, first of all, size doesn't matter when it comes to cost. Something small could cost way more than something big. Um, one of the things, if you put a lot of smarts on board the spacecraft, then you really decrease your operations cost. And um, actually, I forgot where I was going with this, but. Um, <laughs> Just for an example, for the timed mission that I mentioned before, um, it has GPS on board. So that means that the instruments don't have to send a lot of commands because, if, especially if they're pulling this flag in and digesting it and using their um, observation time to take that observation. And uh, the ops team has, um, they do command, but we don't have to turn that transmitter on and off. And because there's a GPS, the navigation is done on board. So all those things um, really minimize the operational involvement. Of course, we're there to help it if it goes into safe. But just to give you an example, we are currently operating that spacecraft, because it has all those smarts, 
with a 1.75 FTE. So, wow. so that's the benefit you get for paying up front to put all the smarts on board. Yeah. Thank you. Good point. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about um, onboard instruments and um, in a couple different areas. And one is, you know, many instruments are capable of obviously recording or capturing a lot of data. And oftentimes downlink is the limiting constraint. And I was wondering if anyone has any experience with onboard autonomous algorithms that are performing intelligent data reduction of instrument data, making decisions on, on what the, you know, where the, the, you know, the event of the century is in that data and being able to down select and, and, and logically downlink the important data. I don't know if anyone had experience with onboard, I'll, I'll call it data reduction if you were on board. Uh, I don't know uh, experience, but we're looking at it. Uh, again, I'll refer back to mass specs because mass specs is an instrument that can produce voluminous amounts of data. <laughs> um, and, and of course, out of Europa, our pipe is relatively small. Um, and so we've actually done some uh, some internal research looking at how we can reduce because if you look at what's done on the ground with a mass spectrometer It sort of reduces down to I can't remember the right term because I'm not the, the uh, mass spectrometer expert But sort of like a line plot of of all the species that are seen and so the the potential data reduction is huge from a Massive amount of data to a very very small amount of data But it takes a lot of algorithmic processing to to make that transition and so we've done some internal research looking at trying to push that up to the spacecraft but uh, sort of as you mentioned earlier the you you start to really run into um, available processing power on board um, and that comes really in two forms uh, one as i alluded to earlier is just available energy uh, orbit energy uh, energy on a mission such as europa but it also comes in the form of you know if you look at the processes that are available to us uh, on orbit in a radiation uh, filled environment there you know we're we're back in the, I don't know, 70s or 80s or something. I don't know where we're, what current technology is, but it's it's old uh, in terms of available processor power and speed. And so it gets really difficult. I think the, to get through, to get a real breakthrough there is really in uh, the area of how can we get more powerful processors on board? And I don't know what the answer is, but I think that's a, a, the big barrier that pops yep. into my head. So I know of some work at JPL uh, by Steve Chen, who I've, I've seen images that show here, this, this, this image has a, a cloud in it, so it's not really helpful, so throw it away, and this image will downlink. Right. So there has been some work, I, I recommend looking at that. Um, but there's, um, there's, there's, a, there's an issue of what, what, what we now phrase as designing for autonomy. And, and that is that we, we, we often try to put these experiments, like I just mentioned, on a spacecraft during an extended mission. And the spacecraft itself isn't really designed to handle it. So for example, the science data on this one mission was being sent down to the ground and the processor didn't really have access to it. And, if it, and, and so we had to come up with this back channel to send the science data to the processor so that it could so an algorithm could process it and then determine if it was an interesting, worthy of sending down image. So, um, so it would be great if we could design these things for autonomous operations from the beginning, but, um, but for now we just have to deal with, okay, this is the spacecraft we're given, what can we do with it? So there's a number of issues to think about. Oh, got a question. Um, yeah, so my name is Christian Fidi from TD Tech. Also, we have designed the central driving assistance system for the Audi 8, which is the first level three system on the market. Uh, and the, the, the problem we, we got there is, uh, so as long as you stay with radar and laser, everything is fine. Yeah, so there is not a lot of complexity behind, but what it really brings to problem is when you do image video processing, uh, and this is then coming in the level three, level four, level five autonomous driving systems. Uh, and there you need a lot of, of, of performance in the system. So we, we're running through the system around 12 gigabit of data, uh, which we are processing in real time with uh, the latest state-of-the-art um, image processing, uh, let's say, capability. And my question is, uh, how, how much of this capability do you need in your applications? So this really extremely hard image processing where you really need to detect 
and then decide on what what you have what you have detected because the problem in this autonomous driving is if you detect uh, like uh, signs on the streets or persons via images yeah this is really a, a extremely difficult and hard thing to do and and that really needs the capability and the performance of the of the gpus yeah i, I don't uh i i don't at least instruments that i've worked with i don't think we need that level of capability because it's not typically that um that level of performance that level of, of uh, because in, in in an autonomous driving situation you're having to make an immediate decision in response so we may not have to make that immediate decision um uh, we may not have quite the level of resolution that you may have in the, in the case of the trying to detect a sign and, and figure out what it says for example um, or is this a person or is it a tumbleweed blown across the road or something like that um, that you have an autonomous driving and um, some of those decisions as Lorraine said, may be able to be delayed. That is, we may have enough storage on board that then we can later decide what we want to downlink, for example. So I, I think, I don't think we have to push it that far. I, I think a lot of us would be happy if we could just get 10% that <laughs> direction. Although there are some missions where we, we would love to have that capability. So uh, for example, if we want to fly through a geyser on Enceladus, <laughs> I know that's kind of far out there, but it's it's something that we're looking at. It's more of a dynamic situation, yeah, um, and and we need to react to it. We need to recognize it. We either need to move forward toward it or away from it to to safe to get the safety. So I don't know if you share any of that technology, but that would be really interesting <laughs> to understand how how you do that now. Oh. So I guess I have a follow-up on that. So there's a, a big market in UAVs. There's a big market in autonomous cars. Um, how integrated or how separate are the space autonomy folks? Uh, or are we working with any of the, the car companies that are actually answering these very hard problems right now? Um, because it looks like they're facing the same challenges except for at a grand scale and we're, we're just trying to get uh, image processing working on our on our uh, uh, spacecraft. So we, we, we've looked into that and we've actually reached out to, to some companies. We've been talking to Google and a number of others. Uh, what, what we find is that the, the, the application is different enough that it's hard to carry over. For example, we, um, I think the automotive world does a lot of training and learning and there's and there's a structured environment there are roads you're trying to follow roads and there's other cars and there's pedestrians and they're well defined it doesn't translate at least to our mars rovers um, so so we don't have a lot of uh, structure or things that we're trying to avoid or identify as as um, a lot of we don't have a lot of training data that we could learn from yeah i think that's a good one i was just going to say because one of the um, one of the terms someone asked us one of the questions and talked about offline learning versus online learning in the car example you can do a lot of offline learning you know like you said there's millions of miles of roads and you can over and over drill it you know keep exercising those scenarios where you're it's your kind of talk about lorraine you don't have that kind of database it's more the online learning uh, because you go you may be going to an environment a geyser that you can't characterize on the ground here on earth without until you get there it's been a challenge to cross over i think there's a, another challenge there as well and i think certainly we want to look at other industries and, and figure out what we can learn um, as lorraine pointed out a few minutes ago but if you look in in drones and autonomous vehicles there's been you know years of r d developing the technologies and then once you develop the technologies and you have to figure out how to transition them into manufacturing and that's where you get your buyback because you're cranking out a lot of these things we're not building you know millions of ford f-150s we're building you know uh, one of these and then one of those and then one of these and and hopefully as things move along and, and we progress in this area we develop some tools and techniques that sort of we can use across a broad spectrum of, um, of autonomous scenarios but it's a very different situation that we find ourselves in in the space community versus you know drones or, or autonomous vehicles because we just don't have that type of 
of ecosystem, if you will. We're just always building something different. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I would, it's a hard nut to crack and I am really open to suggestions. I would love to capitalize on the billions of dollars that are being spent <laughs> in, on, in, in the automotive, in the military. I, I, I just, I haven't figured out how and, and if anybody has ideas, please let me know because that would be wonderful if we could, if we could work together or capitalize on work that's being done in, in, a, in a sister organization. You know, and, and the other factor is, is that, you know, you've got the years of R&D and then transition to manufacture and then you're starting to crank these out. Uh, we get a contract and we got to launch in three years. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. even if there's a desire to do it, there just isn't even if you had a, even if you had a lot of money just in terms of schedule, there just isn't the time to do it. I think that's a big barrier. And that's why I think developing trying to move us along to uh, the technology along and the, the techniques and the approaches so that we have these tools and techniques that have broad applicability is important because that's, to me, that's the way that we can shove it into these tighter timelines. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, on that topic, uh, there is, uh, I, I did read about uh, GE is doing a lot of research in uh, Fitter for their, for their engines, uh, where they analyze the, 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 the terabytes of data coming from the engines uh, in real time through machine learning techniques to hmm. analyze and detect uh, 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 faults and, and, and anomalies in the data uh, just through training of the data. And so it's it's not rule based. It's it's all machine ba machine learning based. So things like that could also be applied on spacecraft, especially deep uh, you know deep space missions where you don't have the, the bandwidth. Um, so I. I I see a lot of applications where you could use machine learning for data analysis uh, and instrument analysis also. So maybe put some machine learning algorithms on board to monitor the health of the vehicle to, to, to assess if it's acting like it was in the past or something abnormal. Sorry. Yeah. So you could use these these techniques to instead of doing just limit checking of, of telemetry, the, the you know traditional way of, of doing that for fitter, uh, you can actually train your data through real telemetry, as as was suggested earlier, to look at real telemetry and train your data with that, to uh, to then um, and then through training and and through techniques like you know a general adversarial networks and things like that to to train your network to. Um, to, to know what the fault is what, and what's, what's weird in your data and your, your system will automatically respond to a fault like that without, without explicitly telling it what's your limits and things like that. Yeah, we're kind of moving in that direction right now. We're doing some development with an SBIR, under an SBIR contract to do some model-based fault management. So it, we know how the box is supposed to work and we can model it. Um, and I think that's a step toward now we're going to learn how it works and, and look at past data from it. We don't quite have the volume or the magnitude of data that, that GE has in their engines because they have thousands of engines that they run for millions of hours. And you know, if we have something like maybe a reaction wheel, we, we, we log how much on time it has on it. And, and it's, you know, it's not in, the, in that level of capacity of hours. But, I like where you're going with that. That that's that's an interesting idea. Got a question in the back. Yeah, it also depends on the task that you're trying to achieve in machine learning algorithms. Uh, what we were talking about up to now are like supervised tasks where you learn where you learn from, you know, you have some data input and those are your training data set. But there are also unsupervised machine learning algorithms that you can apply where you don't need <coughs> an a priori initial data, data set where you train your, your code. Uh, it all goes down to, depends on what you're trying to achieve with these. There are different tasks, supervised and unsupervised machine learning algorithms, classification, clustering, uh, and so on. So uh, the focus should be on both branches, supervised and unsupervised. In this case, perhaps for spacecraft, for like uh, checking the health status, if you might be able to get away with unsupervised algorithms, meaning that you don't need to deal with like terabytes of data to be able to train your system a priori. So I think it's exciting to talk about machine learning, but I want to temper that with our previous discussion on V and V. 
there's a lot that you have to figure out how to be in V. So when when so when a mach machine learning has a lot of pitfalls too, right? I mean, you can you can overtrain, you can train on the wrong set of data, and 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 I I personally would not trust a machine learning algorithm to fix my spacecraft because it has detected a problem at this time. But I think it's a great area to explore. Um, for, for future use. Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to V and V or autonomous algorithms that, that don't learn right. first. <laughs> and then I'll figure out right. you know, right. what, if we can get there with, with learning. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, well, we got a question here. It's on. A question about uh, tools and even languages uh, as far as what you found useful and autonomy, uh, autonomous systems, you know, lend themselves to higher level languages. And flight software, a lot of times, still stuck in the C, C++ type of world. I was wondering what tools you have found useful to help develop these type of projects. Well, I mentioned before that we use uh, JavaScript. There's been, I guess, talk of using other type of scripting languages. Um, so you're uh, flying you're flying a JavaScript engine and then loading JavaScript. Loading software. loading JavaScripts, yeah. Um, I guess uh, all I have to say is guilty as charged. Um, <laughs> we I, I gave a talk about five years ago with a little play on words, and the the title of the talk was "I see we still like C," <laughs> and uh, and that's still yeah. true. I I think some work in tools and and how to do this. In fact. Um, and I may make this point in my talk later, is, um, is a real challenge even on the Cygnus mission of defining these rules. And as we define, we put a lot of work in defining these rules and supplement, but, and it's, but it's not just the rules. It's supplementing it with other information, such as the rationale but behind the rule or behind a threshold or behind a trigger. There's a lot of rationales that go with that. And then inter-rule interactions <laughs> can get you. Yeah. And, and so it's, you know, we need to make progress on just how to define some of the rules, but it, I think maybe some progress has been made, you know, some, some more probably expensive spacecraft has some pretty good tool sets there, but there's a lot of other information that has to be captured that sort of just gets lost. Um, I was gonna ask a little bit, we, we've talked about, you know, uh, research and development a little bit, and I was wondering in, in your organizations, um, in your experience, are there dollars available, time, opportunity, people, and dollars available to do R and D in areas like this? You know, perhaps outside of a of a formal mission, and what kind of constraints you may hit in that area? I feel lucky enough to work at a place where we do have dollars available. Um, but one of the hardest things I'm struggling with now is. Is, is making sure the managers understand why we need yet another research er, tech, research project in autonomy. <laughs> and I, I would love to figure out, my quixotic crusade is to lay out a landscape of autonomy and then be able to place people's research on that landscape. Here's my piece of it, or here's, here's my contribution that hasn't yet been developed, or maybe I'm, I'm developing something that that is better than the last time and and that I think again it gets back to the language how do we explain to the managers that this new autonomous function or autonomous system capability needs to be funded um, and um, again <laughs> I'm asking the crowd if they have yeah. ideas <laughs> I'm reaching out for help um, because I think it's you know even if we get the funding uh, even if funding sources are available, the, the, the key is the message. How do you message it? How do you sell it? How do you explain that this is a this is a component that's that's required to make our systems more autonomous? Um, so we have we have a number of avenues um, at JPL. Some of them are in collaboration with Caltech, who, which manages JPL. Some are in collaboration with strategic universities. Some are coming down from NASA for innovation funds. And and all of these funding sources are available to us. We just have to figure out how to how to sell it. 
Yeah, so following on with that, I, I'm also fortunate to work in an organization. We have an internal research program. We can get some funding, but but there is a, a bit of a of a of a barrier sometimes there, and I think it's true not just in organization, but sort of out there in the community. And that is, oh, it's software. That's not research. Um, and and I think that that's something kind of tying in with how do we package this? I think you know NASA roses and other funding sources. You know, one way to package it might be, and maybe we can, you guys can start jotting it down as you think of ideas. We brought some of them already up here this morning, is enumerating the specific challenges that we have in this area. And there are a lot of them. Um, and maybe if we can write them down and enumerate them, and maybe we can then start to better articulate why we need to go back for more funding in autonomous operations, uh, because we've we've solved this problem or we've solved this part of this problem, but we have all these other problems. And I think, so I'd encourage you all, there's a challenge, a homework assignment for you here in real time to start writing down uh, even things that we've already talked about and other things. What are some of the specific challenges and challenges within those challenges that we really could use funding for to help push this area along? I'd encourage you to do that. Maybe we can uh, get that push to some funding organizations and, and internally and externally to, to make progress here. And, and, and let me just add one more thing. Um, so, so NASA has these capability leadership teams. Has anyone heard of those CLTs? Uh, it used to be TCAT. That was like a four-letter word, but um, <laughs> yeah, right. So, so there is one that's now defined for autonomous systems, and I was I was on the team to help define and scope what that meant, and we came up with categories. And so this is. And, and there are things like collaboration and, and cooperation and sensing and perception and the decision making and then the engineering of those systems. And those are four different ways we, we decompose autonomous systems. And, and that might be a good starting point um, if I can find it and share it. Um, at least it's, it's a way to talk about here's the realm of autonomy. That, and and then you can start to put your your finger on this area. This is the area we're working on, and this is the area that we need more more work in. Mike. Mike. Uh, and um, when when you guys start talking about funding, I know you're talking to me. Um, <laughs> there there's a lot of work that's been done out of NASA headquarters on what she was just mentioning, capability leadership teams, and with the strict budgets we're under right now. What NASA was worried about is that if we're going to go for these missions in the future, what are the capabilities we need to maintain? They were, you know, interested in closing rusted, you know, wind tunnels and facilities and things like this. And many of those were facilities that we may not be doing research in right now, but it's the only one that could meet the kind of environment we needed to test for a hypersonic or something like this. So they, they've come to us, and in, in the NESC, we have these disciplines. We have materials and mechanisms and engines and whatever. And one of them was kicking off was, was something to do with autonomy. It took them like three or four months to come up with what was autonomy. I think that was how that, that worked. <laughs> um, one of the pluses is with this capability leadership, they looked at our future possible missions and said, what are the tall poles, which is a a mission planning vernacular that says what what is the what is the pole that we have to start working on now where we won't get it done by the time we need it and autonomy is one of those and so they're quite aware of that and they're they're actually looking for guidance on where do we spend our money to make this autonomy work and that's part of why they threw me in the under the wheels of this AFTS system because we are looking at how do I verify this your comment was a healthy way of doing it was to run the AFTS system with another system and, and in a mirror or a shadow mode and see how well it worked. Well, it, it, they did it for a number of flights, less than 10, and now it's armed and working. So I, I guess 10 flights was good enough. Um, <laughs> one of the issues when you were comparing the automotive industry and our industry uh, the verification and safety and concern for critical safety is very different when you're building a lot of cars and you're willing to take on, we can deal with this many crashes, okay? And our industry pretty much says, no, we, we don't want to go that route. We want to be much more, we're extremely conservative in the NASA missions. It's, it's very hard to say that they are, that we can use exactly what they're developing in our area. 
But in terms of the budgeting, I, I think I'm certainly open to sending me some emails and we'll work it. Like I said, one of the things I wanted to work on is just getting a real data stream out there that you can start training realistic systems on real data and actually argue that you're at a higher TRL level in some experimental system. One of the things that I think we run across sometimes is that um, there's all this great work being done, IRAD work being done, but at the mission level, they often want to do it the way you did it last time. They don't want to take on the risk. They don't want to, certainly don't want to help pay right. to move that technology forward that, hap that happens to, uh, to us sometimes. Oh, oh got a question. So, uh, kind of on your point, I'm way back here. You were mentioning that, uh, and this fits in with what I, I think, Ronnie, you just said, what the convincing management to take that, what we need to do with autonomy. We actually also have this pro the problem on the research side. Uh, a lot of researchers, they're working in a very academic world with non realistic hardware, non-realistic uh, uh, scenarios, and they're developing algorithms. And, and we've run into this, and, you know, somebody said, well, I've, I've solved your prognostic problems. All you need is, is 3K40 Tesla cards <laughs> in a, on a Xeon processor to, to run this, and our target's a 100 megahertz power PC. So that gap is the Get part of the challenge because sometimes management sees what the researchers are doing and then trying to bridge that on how we can pull that research, raise the TRL to something that's deployable, given the budget of the mission that, uh, that, we've, that we've been deemed, it's hard to, uh, hard to make those two ends meet. Uh, we're finding that that disconnect is actually a, quite a hindrance as well. You know, that's a great point. That, that's always a gap in almost any area of research. But in this area, we've got this additional gap, <laughs> the space gap, if you will, because um, if, if, if it's just a matter of resources uh, in the academic world versus the, the commercial world, then unless it's some embedded system and you've got some constraints, uh, you know, then the gap isn't something that's insurmountable. Right. Uh, in this case, we, you know, it, it certainly appears insurmountable because the, obviously the amount of resources you have here on the ground versus what you have up in space is uh, it's just orders of magnitude. So, uh, But maybe we could uh, make an evolutionary path and, and send up some CubeSats with some high-powered processors and test out some algorithms and, and get things working in space. And, and I, know, I know that I feel like that's unnecessary but not sufficient condition to trust these systems, but that seems like an easier access to space if we can use CubeSats as our experimental platforms to test out these algorithms. I think Davey had a, um, yep. The question I'll repeat it. I don't think the mic was working, but the question was uh, going back to tools, what tools are being used to enable autonomy in a CFS part of that? Well, you know, we've used the limit checker in CFS for a couple of missions, and, 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 and basically the tools are all ground based <laughs> that, that build flight loads for us, you know, from spreadsheets that system engineers are simple enough for system engineers to uh, put together. I think CFS is a nice, uh, a great baseline of, of software that, uh, that has the hooks in it to allow you to add lollipops on the bus, right? Add a new application. And uh, it would be great to test out, say, some of our new advanced fault management model-based approaches by adding it as, as an augmentation to the limit checker. If we could get some funding, Mike, to do that. <laughs> So someone had uh, asked a question uh, talking about, um, and we talked about CubeSats, but the idea of having swarms, having cubes, using CubeSats and having um, autonomous communication between the actual CubeSats to, for data acquisition and so on. And I don't know if anyone had any, any experience in that area with multi-spacecraft uh, communication and swarming. Okay. 
no experience, but um, I think that's a great way to move. Um, if you just look to nature, right. you know, that's what yeah. nature does and how they accomplish, how it accomplishes great things. So yeah. I'm all for that. Yep. Yeah, so whenever I hear about uh, autonomy, I either hear some cool image processing superstructure or doing some maybe 10% better autonomous da data collect. Right. But I never hear, you know, some ladder that defines how we get to a certain space in the autonomy world. So you mentioned the autonomy landscape that we wanted to define. I think we should define some autonomy ladder like the autonomy car world does, level one, two, three, four autonomy, so that we know what we're working towards instead of saying we want to do these four, 10 things, you know, we have a, a systematic way to approach it. Yeah, and um, I, I agree, and, and I've had managers ask to have us do that. We, believe it or not, it's been done before. Um, we defined autonomy levels back in the 90s. Um, we should resurrect that and take a look and see and see if we can dust them off or scrub them in some way. Looks like aerospace is nodding over here. Maybe we can work with them to make it happen. But I completely agree. It would help put, put some structure in our minds of how we think about this. Um, it seems like there's so many different aspects of autonomy when you're talking about a spacecraft that it's, it's not just driving. It's autonomous path planning, it's autonomous mission planning, it's autonomous resource allocation, it's autonomous fault management. Maybe each one of those needs a ladder, I'm not sure. Um, but that's where I struggled to figure out, okay, I, I'm, I, I wasn't able to fully lay out the levels and also capture all of the angles or the <laughs> disciplines, if you will. But I, I love the idea and, and wouldn't mind working on it with people if they're interested in helping me. We had a question here. Uh, Chris Knight. I think it's working now. There we are. Um, Chris Knight from Ames, actually. I'm not, not really an autonomy person, but I, I know some that are at Ames and, and uh, I know that we're doing swarms. We have some folks here from Ames who are working on some swarm mis uh, CubeSat missions and, and looking at uh, how we might autonomously operate those. Um, uh, going back to um, the comment about scripting, actually, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on uh, real-time environments and scripting languages. Um, and then one more thing before I stop is that uh, I actually was, was involved in a project in Lori, uh, I don't know if Lori Prokop is here right now, but Lori at JSC uh, uh, kind of led a, a project to integrate um, systems down at JSC in a lab, uh, and we demonstrated a, a first pass at autonomous uh, diagnostics using a model-based, uh, actually two model-based diagnostic engines in their real-time uh, VxWorks CFS environment. So um, certainly if folks want to talk to me or I can relay the information. <laughs> Your question, you asked about real-time scripting, right? You said, yeah. yeah. So this, uh, yeah, real time, I mean, uh, real time, that's one of the things with the diagnostic engines, we were like, well, okay, what happens if you go over the your time slice and all, all the implications that has on, on the real time environment? And then, you know, thinking as a, you know, scripting, you know, I've been, a lot, you know, been around scripting forever. So knowing that scripting engines tend to not be terribly real time friendly, how to, what sort of, do you have, have you looked at, I mean, obviously JavaScript, you could probably tune it to turn off garbage collection and a lot of things that would, hang you up, but uh, are there any folks here that have other thoughts on like uh, specially designed, um, I know that Java, I was looking, just Googling Java has a real time version of the Java engine. I'm sure there's others that have similar. Yeah, so I, I haven't done it myself. I know it has been done. Bruce talked about uh, putting JavaScript on. I know uh, a, a Python engine has been launched before. And, and I think, so I don't think it's a technological barrier there. It, can be done, has been done, but your, your question actually made me think of another uh, sort of uh, dichotomy that we have in this area, in some portions of this area, and that is that if I had a scripting engine on board, I don't want to tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason is, is, is that when, when you're in, I mentioned this, we get a contract in three years to launch. What we want to do is we want to force people, scientists, engineers, various people to make decisions. 
I need a decision because we have to design and develop and, and, and test this. And if I tell them I have a scripting engine on board, they immediately jump to, oh, I can delay all my decisions until later, maybe even after we launch the thing. And, and this is a real challenge in this area. And again, very just a, a small part. I know that's not the overall topic of autonomy, but th this is a little bit of a challenge because sometimes we have the ability maybe to put some flexibility into the system, but we really don't want it known that it's there. <laughs> Uh, I just want to do one quick go back. Uh, NASA aims to jog my memory. They did, uh, I want to recognize them. They did crack the uh, industry collaboration. They have a collaboration with Nissan for doing some uh, autonomy related uh, work. So they were successful in that. Kudos to you guys. All right, we got time for two more questions. We'll go here. Um, Steven Seeger from Goddard. Uh, there was a question posed a few minutes ago about, about swarms and, and how they communicate with each other. And I don't know if you're aware, but there's a lot of work being done in ad hoc wireless sensor networks where there's effort to do a or s series of generic communication protocols that are able to handle cases where some of the peers might lose RX or TX. And then how does the constellation behave in response to that? Um, and there's a lot of work actually also in um, autonomous cars. They're, they're dealing with that. Like if you have fleet formations and then, you know, how can you detect, okay, we, this guy can't get peer to peer telemetry. Therefore, you know, he has to be able to detect that and back off and the other nodes maybe need to, to give them, give that one a wide berth or something like that. So there's, there's a, uh, it's easy to think of autonomy and think of, well, how can I, in my specific case, respond to these events? But there's actually a lot of work being done on the generic level of how, at the protocol level, can we communicate that this happened and deal with that and then have our system performance degrade safely as a result of that. And then the other thing I wanted to respond to Chris, who asked about um, real-time scripting languages. And all I would say is anytime you have something as dynamic as a scripting environment like Python, you can essentially make it real-time by getting rid of garbage collection and instead of having maximum bounds on anything that can occur in the environment, like so many, you know, some maximum amount of variables or objects or things that can be created because then you have a deterministic walk to clean up your state as you move through the system. And certainly, I, I think that's where a lot of the real-time engines go. Yeah. Um, that's All right. Thanks. All right, the last question here. Am I the here? That's it. Well, okay. I, I, I just wanted to go back to what Lorraine was saying about auto defining appropriate levels of autonomy. I've seen about six of them. They don't match at all. <laughs> They're all about the solution to a problem they don't mention. And finding the right problems for autonomy might help organize that. Yeah. My guess is that if any 10 people in this room wrote down four levels of autonomy, there'd be essentially a zero empty intersection. <laughs> 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 because we need right. it for different reasons. Right. We haven't quite clarified those reasons. Yeah, and I, I think that goes for Lorraine's correct. original comment that autonomous docking, autonomous whatever. Autonomy has been around a long time. I used to, I worked for years training pilots on flight simulators. And the Lockheed L-1011, if you remember that aircraft, had an autonomous landing system. It would actually follow the radio beam all the way to landing. And they were, they were intending to sell that as something to land the plane in the fog, where they had zero visibility, they could still land the plane. The problem was once it landed, it could not find the taxiway and could not find the airport. So autonomy has these issues, but that's been around a long time. So they can solve one problem and not the other. Um, I'd like to roll this all the way back to something that came out, which was um, they like to put off the decisions until the last minute. Okay, And this doesn't even have to deal with autonomy. This can deal with coefficients to your rocket engines or to your Anything. coefficients particular range or something like this. I'm right now struggling with, if you do a flight software system test on a particular set of coefficients, and then you change those coefficients before flight, what is your formal verification? We talk about regression testing, but I'm questioning regression testing in the terms of, we have some, some commercial crews that are uploading 2,000 coefficients before flight, literally days before flight kind of thing. And this goes all the way to rule-based, because we did some experiments. You do test coverage during software system test, and you look at test coverage of 95%. You, you load in a tiny rule-based, you get 95%. You load in a really big rule-based, 
you get 95% because <laughs> it's really not testing the rules. It's testing the interpreting engines. So there's some real problems with verifying this and, and, and actually it isn't in the future. Like I said, they threw me under the bus with this AFTS system. So I've got all your email address. <laughs> all right. You're um, going to need some new methods. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, with that, I would like to thank our board. i um, Lorraine Fesk, um, Alice Bowman, Ronnie Kilo, and Bruce Vag. Let's give them a hand for. <laughs> and thanks to the to the audience and the participate participation. These were really good questions and just great discussion. So I'm going to turn it back over to Sabot here and thank you. And um, my sincere thanks to Adrian for organizing this and, and also to Michelle for organizing and having such a great, I don't think there is any better moderator in this building than Adrian. <laughs> thank you very much, Adrian. We uh, we were lucky to have him. Thank you. And uh, so we'll break for uh, one hour and then come back um, at one o'clock. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Are you staying nearby or are you? I'm in the hallway. Okay, that's good. So that's Let's go upload your. That happened. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to stop the broadcast uh, and then we are going to kick start a new one at the. All right.